Okay, hello, welcome everyone. I am Joan Du, Dean of the Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design at the University of Toronto. I am joined by Anna Robo from the Center for Sustainable Urban Development at Columbia University. We want to thank you all for joining us today for the Design for Resilient Communities International Symposium. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the land on which the, New York, the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. The reason we are gathered today is to discuss an issue that I think is at the forefront of many of our communities and schools and practices. We recognize from climate change to political turmoil, the world is facing unparalleled challenges and resilient community could be at the core of the solutions and the process in which for us to address this. What is a resilient community? For us, resilience anticipates, adopts to, and recovers at, from adversity. Today's symposium has brought together designers, practitioners, scholars, educators, and activists to discuss how design can contribute to building strong and adoptable communities by encouraging innovative solutions, and facilitating the development of knowledge and skills necessary for endurance and recovery for communities around the world. Now I invite Anna to share with us the importance of the UN SDGs and how this event aims to contribute to the SDGs in facilitating communities to be able to create resilience for themselves and with the participation of all of us. Go ahead, Anna. Uh, uh, th thank, thank you. Um, uh, this, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the SDGs and there's a slide showing the SDGs, the first slide uh, for that. Thank you very much. Um, the SDGs uh, are a very broad reaching um, and uh, wide ranging set of goals. Uh, they're actually from 2015 to 2030. And as you can see here, the 17 goals touch on every aspect of life. And if indeed we are to have a sustainable future, it seems to me that all of us working in whatever area uh, could do well to consider each one, uh, thinking about the design professions, no poverty, life on land, peace and justice, uh, responsible consumption, all of these issues are immensely important. And I think it's their very breadth that makes them important for us as designers to think about. I also want to draw your attention to the new urban agenda, uh, which was developed by UN Habitat. And if we go to the next slide, um, the, if we look at what the new urban agenda and the SDGs are about, uh, we see that enormous number of countries signed on, 193, uh, to the urban agenda, 167. And they work as an accelerator of the SDGs and especially SDG 11. So what goals matter most to designers? Uh, is it cities? Is it climate action? Is it the reduced inequalities? Uh, peace, strong justice institutions, health and well-being. Um, so these are the sorts of things that they bring into focus for us uh, as we have a conversation about design, about sustainability, and indeed the future of the world. So I just want to take you to another slide, which uh, the next slide, which uh, focuses in on goal 11, sustainable cities and communities. And it's been, this has been the goal that's been of most interest to designers. And yet, if we look at it, we start to see that there's an interconnection between all those goals. And it's that interconnection that to take a deep dive into these goals, to think about how these goals might be localized and to explore the inter interconnections uh, between these goals. And I hope this is some of what we're going to do to today. And 
to, to think about what these goals are, the importance of these goals to our effort today, which is to bring the, uh, the concept of resilience and resilient communities into focus. Uh, so this is to try and just get us thinking a little bit about the goals, about all of the goals, and not just to focus on uh, goal 11. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll move on uh, to the next part of our program and to bring it back to what we're doing at this, this, this symposium. And, and to also relate it to, uh, to uh, the, the efforts of the UIA, the Union of International Architects. So our symposium also launches a call for engagement with the 2023 Union of International Architects World Congress. And they have adopted the theme of leave no one behind. And it will aim to promote, discuss, create and showcase <clears throat> architecture as a vital tool to help achieve these 17 uh, development goals, the ones that I have just shown you. Now, as I noted in the slides, they were adopted by 993 countries and they offer an inclusive roadmap to a more sustainable future. And a key issue for the design of resilient communities, thematic panels for UIA is how can the global initiative of the SDGs be localized in communities around the world? And so that was what I also emphasized in the slides. The whole idea is how can the SDGs be localized, not just remain as some generalization that deals with the world. So we applaud the UIA for putting the SDGs center stage at their Congress in Copenhagen next, day, next year. And this week, uh, we have clearly seen the publication of the latest IPC report, and it is clearly time for action by all of us. Um, we also see there are challenges for higher education, and we are located uh, here at the University of Toronto, uh, but the, the institutes producing the next generation of decision makers uh, have an enormous responsibility. So I want to bring to your attention a 2022 UNESCO report, Global in its thinking, this, the title of it is Knowledge Driven Actions Transforming Higher Education for Global Sustainability. And it recommends that the SDGs be taken up throughout the higher education curricula. So these are sort of two sort of impulses uh, for, for, for our session today. Over to you, Joanne. Jo jo Thank you, Anna. So for today's symposium, we have organized three panels and each panel is organized as a set of dialogues between international practitioner, practitioners of community engagement and design, as well as in conversation with Anna and myself and our uh, and members of the local communities here in Toronto. And the, the three questions evolve around global and local, people and resiliency, and community, community and housing. Our international and local contributors will share the knowledge about design, research, and practices that contributed positively to building resilient communities for and with people. We're very, very glad to be joined by professionals, policymakers, academics, and activists. We welcome our speakers from New York, Mumbai, Rio, Johannesburg, Kamasi, and Sydney. Each panel is also joined by a local speaker from Toronto who help us to remember that for research, design, and policies concerning communities, they all must be grounded in the specificities of localized places and people. Design for resilient communities require interdisciplinary approaches to articulate these cross-sectorial issues as well as informed co-design partnerships to achieve community-driven solutions. So let's get started with our first panel. Anna would moderate panels one and two, and I will moderate panel three, as well as the con concluding discussions. So thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to an engaging few hours with you. Back to you, Anna. Thank you, Joanne. Now let's get started with panel one, global and local. I'm delighted to introduce you to our three speakers, Andrew Rudd from UN Habitat in New York, Supriya Chayagatin from Mumbai, Perkins Eastman in M Mumbai, and Dori Tunstall, an activist academic here in Toronto. 
Now our ground rules are that each speaker has eight minutes to address our panel one question through their work or their practice. So let's take a moment to look at question one, and you can see it there in the, in the, in, on the screen. So our question is, how could the adaptation or integration of international initiatives, such as the SDGs, provide interdisciplinary knowledge and tools to address urgent local needs for resiliency and specific regional inequalities, as well as the ability to work collaboratively with communities. Now, that's quite a big topic. <laughs> but anyway, so let's get started with that. And please welcome our first panelist, Andrew Rudd. Andrew is a Human Settlements Officer in the Program Development Branch at UN Habitat. An architect and urban designer by training, he helped secure SDG 11, which we've just spoken about, and has managed urban environment projects in more than 25 countries. Andrew, you have the floor. Terrific, Anna. Thank you so much. It's a real honor to be here. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to uh, everyone wherever they are in the world. Um, I'll just jump right in and say that uh, on Wednesday, I read this article in The Guardian. Uh, it was about a report just released by the International Resource Panel. Uh, it essentially concludes that over the last 50 years, global ecological damage uh, is largely the responsibility of the very wealthiest developed countries. And that's not particularly surprising, but what really caught my attention was the three uh, front runners on the right. What do these three all have in common? These are the land rich uh, developed countries. And this shows that it's not just wealth driving consumption, uh, but it's also space space and the form and the infrastructure that derives from that. Um, their, their calculation was complicated, but this is in no small part, I think the sum of every single freestanding uh, home that's segregated by car-centric streets uh, and, and connected over longer distances by airplanes. Um, these three countries also happen to have federal governments, which even though they're an extra degree removed from what's happening locally, are still responsible for a lot of the policies and subsidies that influence the forms and flows that, that <laughs> determine these numbers. Next, please. Now that article brought me right back to 2014, which was the year the UN was debating the SDGs. Uh, and part of that debate was, was actually whether or not to have an urban goal. Were sustainable cities and communities actually something to globally aspire to. There was no consensus on that question. And land-rich developed countries uh, were actually some of the biggest skeptics of this urban goal. They all had different articulations of their position, but the gist was largely the same. Federal governments don't get, don't get involved in cities. Um, our priorities are housing, jobs, and services, uh, never mind how they're connected or whether they're accessible. Uh, and for many of them, well, you know, actually we can afford to sprawl. That, that was more or less the message we got. We argued uh, successfully, I guess, <laughs> uh, that a focus on space, place, and communities would be critical. And SDG 11 that resulted, uh, shown on the left as part of the society tier, um, has in fact the first global metrics on sprawl and public space. And on the right, you see uh, how the achievement of the targets of the urban goal uh, have a knock on effect uh, to higher level achievements in sectors like food, water and energy. Next. Translating all of this, as, as Anna framed in the beginning, into concrete realities on the ground is a very different story. Two of the most uh, common contexts we encounter at UN Habitat, where I work, are unplanned communities on the left, uh, which was the primary reason for our founding in 76, and soon to be built communities on the right. And it's exactly in these peri-urban areas where uh, I, I think I can safely say so many of the wasteful mistakes of land-rich developed countries in the 20th century are being replicated uh, in emerging economies of the 21st, and at a much wider scale. Uh, Karen Sito at Yale did a, a, a very pioneering study in 2013 showing uh, projected urban expansion 
uh, would more than double the size of cities by 2030, uh, the year the SDGs end, and that's much faster than population. Uh, so the imperative for us, I suppose, is how we can avoid these mistakes going forward. Next. Fortunately, there's been a lot of guidance in the years since, including the new urban agenda, which Anna mentioned, and a lot of practical spin-offs at multiple scales. Um, and I already mentioned the UNESCO report, um, which calls for SDG education at all higher levels, uh, and the very practical initiative um, that the International Union of Architects and, and UN Habitat have just launched, the UIA 2030 award, uh, which celebrates uh, built projects that embody the SDGs in their uh, design, in their execution, and in their occupancy. Uh, regional finalists were announced last month, the final round next month at the World Urban Forum, but I'd like to just highlight five of these, chosen purely for illustrative purposes uh, and arranged in uh, descending order of scale. Next, please. I have next slide, please. One moment, please. In our prep for this event, we had a very healthy discourse on fonts in kerning and presentations, and I didn't mention, but you'll see that my trick has been uh, the textless wonder, <laughs> a zero text presentation, which usually makes things easy. Sorry for the uh, technical problems. Do, uh, I'm just wondering, are we able to solve this technical problem? Um, so Andrew can show these examples of the uh, this uh, recent uh, competition for uh, SDGs projects. Um, okay, well, Andrew, uh, perhaps we should just um, just have a little chat about this while. Oh, there we go. Look, oh no, it doesn't look like we've, we've got there. Um, no, we're having a problem with this. Um, so Andrew, would you like to um, talk a little bit? Oh, here we go. There, I think. Ah, uh, terrific. Yes, it looks like we're back. Yep. Just one more forward. There. Great, thanks. Thanks for the work that went behind that. Uh, so we start at the widest scale in Buenos Aires. Uh, here we have an entire informal neighborhood uh, wedged between and in some cases beneath a multi-lane highway. Uh, it has been retrofitted in situ after many years work uh, with local authorities. Uh, tenure has been secured for many residents. Uh, trunk infrastructure has been extended. Um, Self-improvement building up as resources allow uh, has happened. Uh, and I think most importantly, the community here has met several times to debate and decide on optimal locations for new open spaces, which you see in green at the left. Um, this requires the consent of a few residents who will have to be relocated uh, and compensated through a uh, pooled funding uh, to make space for collective goods. I think that's an extremely important uh, example uh, and it really shows that inspiring change can happen at scale if we give it the time. Next, please. This is in Copenhagen. It's a city park over multiple blocks. 
Uh, it collects rainwater in a series of pools, uh, some of whose primary programming is recreation. It's uh, athletic fields, but they also serve as overflow for incidents of extreme precipitation. And this is helping the city adapt to climate change, I would say both physically and psychologically. Um, as disinformation, for example, and climate denial really stymie some of the progress we need to make towards tackling climate in the world, this is really irrefutable proof uh, in the form of this park that's both uh, a warning and a protection. Next, please. Uh, we move to the scale uh, of the site. This is a small island in Turkey. Uh, and the mayor of this city noted that there were virtually no open spaces in the city and negotiated with the public school, which was under design at the time, um, to design the landscape in a very open and porous manner. Uh, all the exterior spaces, whether pervious or impervious in surface, are accessible from the street. And after hours, a lot of citizens will gather in these spaces and play, as well as students. And this is, uh, to my mind, really remarkable for its conviviality uh, in a time when liability and litigation are increasing um, on the legal end and, and physically many schools and other institutions are becoming real fortresses behind fences. This is bucking that trend very refreshingly. Next, please. <clears throat> Scale of the building now. This is a house in Ecuador. It's coping with very high heat and humidity through very thoughtfully engineered passive uh, design and local materiality. No air conditioning necessary. Uh, and we're told <laughs> it's sufficiently comfortable uh, to serve as a vacation rental for expats who are already, already not accustomed uh, to this level of heat and humidity in the first place. Uh, next, please. And this is my final slide. This is a room, scale of the room in Hong Kong. It's a room and it's also an apartment for an entire family. This is very typical of uh, the increasing subdivision of apartments, rentals, and high rises there. There's a real crisis of affordability. Um, any improvements to apartments, even if self-paid, are routinely appropriated by landlords, uh, and they lead to increased rents and often eviction. Uh, so the architects here have very ingeniously designed modular furniture. Um, it's affordable. It can be installed discreetly. It makes tight apartments much more comfortably multifunctional. Uh, and it allows tenants to take it with them when they leave. And for me, this shows that fine-grained modular solutions, even when they're modest, can make a real difference in the lives of uh, overcrowded families. Uh, and this is a really big part of what the SDGs need to translate down into. If they're going to make a difference uh, in the lives of everyday people, and aggregate up uh, to a scale that's going to deliver uh, the global impact uh, that we really require. This doesn't exempt higher level action. Uh, citywide uh, public spaces, metropolitan uh, transport plans, and even higher um, you know, watershed management. Um, but, but this is a start. It's what we need to see much, much more of. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I think this is a, a wonderful start to our discussion and because of both the thinking that went into his thinking went into goal 11, but also to now see the application of the SDGs within the design professions. Uh, Andrew, I don't know whether you can share in the chat room uh, the link to the, uh, the, the, the finalists in that project. I think uh, people might like to uh, take their time and look at uh, some of those examples because there are, are many. So thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for a, a terrific start. Now, next we have um, Supriya, Supriya um, Tarajian uh, from Mumbai, and uh, she is the executive director of Perkins Eastman International in Mumbai. Uh, she has degrees in architecture and construction management from India and the UK. And Supriya is going to talk about a project which uh, is another level of engagement, which is the engagement of international practices with local universities and local students uh, as a means to, uh, to uh, engage with the SDGs. So welcome Supriya and thank you very much for your contribution. 
Thank you and uh, good day everyone and thanks for this opportunity. Um, the presentation today will showcase the Brit Studio uh, that was conducted by Perkins Eastman in partnership with architectural students of uh, Kamla Raheja Vidyanadi Institute of Architecture and Environmental Studies in Mumbai. Next please. So it's all started in 2016 uh, when Mumbai Port Trust issued RFP for master planning of 873 hectares of land of Mumbai Port Complex land. This was initially used as port lands and now derelict and uh, kind of underused, uh, still belongs to the Mumbai Port Trust. Uh, Perkins Eastman, a global architectural design firm was invited to participate in the bid. Uh, this was an exciting prospect, not only for the firm, but personally for me, having grown up in Mumbai, this project was the perfect opportunity to reposition the port's land to became, become once again the center of uh, Mumbai metropolitan region, to create new portals to Mumbai, uh, to define a new image for the city, and to provide much needed breathing space and civic amenities for an open space starved city. Here are some of the images uh, of the concept master plan uh, developed for the competition. Next, please. Um, in the fall of 2018, we were discussing the opportunity to participate at the World Urban Forum tent through Local Project Challenge. LPC was inviting practitioners to collaborate with schools and take up project the former had worked on and develop it with students through the lens of sustainable development goals. There were 16 cities identified around the world and Mumbai was one of them. As strong advocates of sustainable development, this was a very exciting opportunity that we didn't want to miss. We uh, decided to take our design proposal for the Mumbai Port Labs ahead for LPC. To our delight, the planning officer at Mumbai Port Trust was as excited and offered us full support for the studio project. Uh, we also received a welcome response from the faculty at Kamla Raheja, the school where I am an alumna. Um, it was encouraging to see how within the framework of the curriculum, the faculty had curated a semester where students can work directly with practitioners to learn how a real project is approached and developed. This was the beginning of the Brit Studio. Next please. The studio began in June, 2018. It was conducted over 16 weekends at Perkins Eastman's Mumbai office giving students an exposure to the professional work environment, an opportunity to engage with some of our colleagues and immerse in our work culture. We had planned the studio to mirror a live project so students understand the various stakeholders involved and the process of decision-making while still nurturing their design thinking, but reviewing all of this uh, through perspectives of SDGs. Weekly sessions included site visits and studies, lectures by local and international experts, and meeting with civic organizations. These are all pictures um, on the slide from our studio, uh, from college, and some interactions that we've had with outside tourists. Next, please. The city became the client um, and we divided students to assume role of various stakeholders. Uh, studio, the studio followed an unconventional approach by facilitating the students to become advocate for competing claimants for the city land, such as open space, parks, commercial developers, tourism, housing, water management, heritage and wildlife conservation. Emulating a real world scenario, uh, the students worked on various iterations of the master plan for a 160 acre site, Darukhana site within the larger port complex through informed debate and advocacy for existing and imagined users while also learning to leverage opposing interests. Students worked as a committee to jointly draw up frameworks or parameters uh, that you see on the slide for the site that balances various interests at stake while responding to impending challenges of climate change. This framework served uh, as an urban design guideline for the master plans, as well as a starting point for a conversation with city authorities, including planners from the Mumbai Port Trust. 
You also see mind maps that were developed by different stakeholders about the site and what they would experience and imagine about the design for this project. Next, please. Students were divided into five groups. Um, the resulting proposals responded to the SDGs and the new urban agenda while working to provide creative approaches to making a livable and a future-proof city. Here are samples of a few proposals. Um, the Soak City, this proposal looked at the site from a, a perspective of an environmentalist and focused on uh, water management and flood mitigation techniques as their starting point. The design process began with studying the site topography and proposed a central biosphere where water was collected through pebble beds and uh, rain gardens lining the streets. Um, redefining urban mobility, here the idea here was to create a city with multiple modes of green transport networks and pedestrian streets which provide ease of access to the residents on a daily basis and also create an urban magnet for tourists and offer them a variety of experiences within the development. Um, although each group was focused on one central idea for the master plan, they became aware of different design narratives through constant dialogues and interactions that they had over uh, with each other. Next, please. The project was submitted for local project challenge stage one, uh, where we presented our concept and process for the studio. After being shortlisted for stage two, uh, we submitted students work panels uh, and uploaded them on the website. Um, this online gallery actually features projects from 39 different countries and it has an over 110 projects with photographs, drawings, videos, and websites, all telling uh, project stories. Uh, in February of 2020, uh, we received the news that the project has been selected um, as one of the finalists. So with immense excitement, we went to Abu Dhabi at uh, the World Urban Forum 10. It was a pleasure to represent our country, our city, and a project so close to our hearts. Um, our efforts were recognized um, and we were awarded the Innovation in Education Award. Next, please. Um, so this didn't come easy. It had its own set of challenges. Uh, this was the first time some of the young practitioners were conducting an academic studio. So a lot of discussions went into how to structure the studio, um, what should be the steps? How do we actually provide students with a real life, uh, real life project experience? Um, a real project of this scale would have taken months to design. Uh, however, the studio was conducted over merely 16 weekends. Um, the other challenge was while a lot of students were comfortable assuming the role of environmentalists or NGOs for stakeholders, there was a huge resistance uh, to play the role of a developer. Uh, so we had to, you know, initially get all of them together and after multiple interactions over chai and table tennis breaks, the whole group sort of came together seamlessly to pursue a common goal. After the culmination of the studio, uh, many of our colleagues actually went on to take up teaching roles at the school, which they had never done before. And many of the students came back to Perkins Eastman for internship opportunities. The Brit Studio uh, through Local Project Challenge was a successful engagement to bring together various organizations to make something, something like a global initiative like SDGs accessible to students and eventually to the local community. Next, please. Um, the studio was intensive, challenging, but I think most importantly, we did not forget to have a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you, Supriya. Um, that was wonderful and a wonderful compliment to the previous presentation of uh, the professionals at work. And we just saw students at work, but in collaboration with an international uh, architectural firm uh, presents a really interesting model uh, to my way of thinking. So uh, now we turn to, uh, uh, to, uh, to Dory Tunstall, and it's uh, a very great ple uh, to pleasure to introduce Dory. Uh, she is a design anthropologist, public intellectual and design advocate who works at the intersections of critical theory, culture and design. 
As Dean of Design at Ontario College of Art and Design University, she is the first Black and female de Dean of a Faculty of Design. So welcome, Dory, and we look forward to your presentation. Uh, good morning. Uh, let's start my video. There we go. Here I am. <laughs> um, so I'm going to take a little bit of a different tack. Um, my presentation is localization for as near for resilient communities. And I'm going to talk um, specifically about how community resilience relies on both global and local relations. Um, and particularly focus on three examples of local power. Um, the first is a community called GEO and their relationship to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, next, I'll talk about the Koori Heritage Trust and kind of branching out to other sort of uh, kind of uh, international or global uh, institutional structures, uh, the UN uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and then bringing it to home, um, I'll talk about OCAD University and the way in which we use the UN Declaration of the International Decade for the People of African Descent to, again, sort of use, um, use international institutional structures um, in many ways to put forward our local agendas uh, within the local context. Uh, so, CEO. Uh, so, CEO is an organization uh, established in Canada in 2015. And uh, what it consists of is, again, a community of women and non binary people who are coming together through an ethos of radical generosity to work on what they call the world's to do list, which is the uh, which is of the UN Sustainable Development Goals is what they reframe as the world's to do list. Um, and the model of this community is that you have a group of women and non binary people who serve as activators who provide basically the funding for the second group of women and non-binary people who are venturers. So these are mostly small businesses um, run by women and non-binary people. Again, all driven by the uh, social development goals. And what the activators money is used to do is to provide five years of zero interest loans um, for the organization in order to, um, for the ventures in order to be able to sort of drive their businesses and bring them to the next level. And so again, all of the ventures are, uh, uh, they, the ventures apply and then they are evaluated in relationship to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which again, were established in 2015. So as soon as they came out, <laughs> Uh, Vicky Sanders, who's the founder of CEO, used those as a way to, uh, in some ways, create a set of metrics around um, the impact and the intentionality, as well as the global connectivity um, of the CEO of interest. And so um, this beautiful sort of uh, circular image here is actually a, visualize, a data visualization um, from the most recent uh, 2021 impact report on um, how all of these ventures from Canada, the United States, New Zealand, Australia, and the UK are working towards um, the sustainable development goals. Um, and so they're separated in terms of like which goals they're focused on. Um, and then when you dig deeper into the actual, um, actual, uh, uh, venture, it gives you more details in terms of like, uh, what are they doing? How are they tracking? Uh, what impact are they actually having in this sort of way? So in this first example, we have this uh, UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals used as a way to, on the one hand, bring together a global community, but it's also being used in, it's also being used to determine the kind of metrics and reframe the kind of metrics around entrepreneurial success, um, especially in a context where, again, many of the metrics, the normal metrics of entrepreneurial success uh, don't take into account these goals. And so they're using this international platform of the UN um, um, 
sustainable development goals to reframe the understanding of entrepreneurship, especially in this ecosystem, which is um, meant to support women and non-binary people. Uh, the second example that I'll talk about is the Koori Heritage Trust. Um, so the Koori Heritage Trust was uh, established in 18, I'm sorry, in 1985. Um, when a, Curry Elder um, and uh, two lawyers uh, sued uh, the uh, University of Melbourne uh, for the repatriation of uh, materials, um, um, materials of a cultural heritage that had belonged to the Curry people. Um, and so they uh, gathered, um, they won successfully the suit against the um, against the museum as well as uh, the city. Um, their materials were repatriated back to uh, Koori uh, communities. And then um, they established a museum on uh, originally on, if you know Melbourne uh, or NARM uh, in King Street. Um, and, but then what happened is in 2018, they had actually moved um, to Federation Square, which is, if you are familiar with NARM or by its sort of colonial name, Melbourne, that is actually like the tourist and the city center um, of, of the city of NARM or the city of Melbourne. And so it's a nonprofit organization, First Nations owned and managed. Um, it provides uh, the um, community space. It, it, again, it has a collection of a hundred thousand items of Koori heritage. Um, and it's also a site um, in which uh, members of Koori community can um, investigate um, their heritage and, and lineages uh, due to um, separations of the uh, of indigenous people, the Koori people from their families through a process which in Canada were very um, similar like residential schools and um, um, and stolen sort of generations in terms of uh, uh, Koori youth um, being put into um, um, as institutional homes or in um, private homes. And so um, there's also a site to be able to reconnect to culture. And what's been really important um, in the ability for the Koori Heritage Trust to move from where they were in King Street, which was sort of on the periphery of the city in many ways, to moving to Federation Square, which is the heart of the city, was their active use of the UN Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous People and particularly sort of Article 11, uh, which um, then allowed them to pressure um, both the state government, um, the federal government, the Australian federal government, as well as the uh, sort of local um, city of Melbourne government to um, provide resources to um, better support um, the practice of revitalization of Koori heritage, the protection of Koori heritage, um, and, uh, and to, again, to perform redress. And so um, what was really, again, really important is that, um, that, uh, in many cases, using this international uh, initiative, which interestingly enough, uh, Australia, United States, New Zealand, and uh, Canada were originally the four nations that did not sign the UN Declaration of Recognition of Indigenous uh, Peoples. Um, until four years after the original uh, proposal had put forth and been approved by other nations. And that speaks to, again, the, the fraughtness of these colonial settler states and their relationships to indigenous peoples that um, it was only through the pressure of all the other nations of the world that these four nations felt in many ways shamed to um, sign the declaration. And then again, in this situation you have local community, in this case, Koori uh, communities in Southern Australia, again, using that uh, international pressure 
um, to further in many ways uh, negotiate repatriation and greater prominence as a cultural institution um, um, through the, the fact that Australia had finally signed this declaration. And then again, just speaking close to home at OCAD University, we've, uh, we've been effective in using the UN Declaration for the International Decade for People of African Descent, which um, was established in 2013 and uh, had uh, declared that from 2015 to 2025, uh, acknowledge all the ways in which states need to focus on addressing in the inequities um, and the ongoing uh, prejudice and uh, discrimination faced by people of African descent. And so what this did is that uh, one of the things that OCAG University did is had our first Black cluster hire. Um, and what was really important, so this is the language directly from the call, was actually being able to connect this initiative, which for the institution was seen as very risky, to this UN declaration, right, to something that is international, something that had been signed off by the Canadian government as well, so that if we had any issues, if any issues appeared, uh, either on the national or in the international level, by creating a call for Black applicants, which was closed to anyone who was not self-identified as Black of African descent, um, again, under the Ontario Human Rights Code, um, to provide coverage for this risky venture um, because we could tie it to, this is how we're demonstrating um, our commitment to this UN declaration. Um, and then just kind of like uh, that, if you want to know more about how that process happened, uh, on May the 4th, we're actually doing, I'm teaching a course on hire for decolonization, diversity and inclusion that actually kind of walks through that entire process, including how a lot of the international, national, as well as uh, local legal structures uh, created this sort of context to be able to do um, significant transformation um, in, in our hiring practices uh, in, in post-secondary education. So the point that I'm trying to make is that uh, community res resilience relies both on global and local relations. And what has been important in these examples is that um, communities can use these global structures to legitimize their fights against, in many ways, their own local institutions, especially the ones um, that have been creating the conditions that uh, require communities to be resilient in the first place. Um, and so local and global often have to work together in these contexts in order to bring about um, significant social and cultural change. Um, and uh, the importance of these kind of international declarations, which sometimes may feel only performative, um, they can actually be actualized or made manifest um, in their use um, by the communities themselves who, um, again, are clever and effective um, in using them as tools um, to bring about change. So if you want to learn more, uh, feel free to email me or connect with me on Instagram. Thank you, Dory. <clears throat> um... Absolutely wonderful presentation. Uh, and I think uh, what we've done is to sort of come at this global and local issue from such wonderfully diverse perspectives. And I think it's sort of laid the groundwork for everything else we want to do uh, throughout the this symposium. But we now have, because you've all been so terrific in keeping to time, uh, we now have uh, about 10 or 15 minutes uh, for, for questions. And I would like to ask if any of the speakers have questions of each other uh, to, to, to start, start with. Does anybody have a question for, for each other? Andrew, uh, Supriya, or, or Dori, um, if there's a question um, sort of lying there. Uh, and just as, a, by, as giving you a little chance to think, uh, by way of comment, I think the, what, what Dory has said is extremely important. And I think it's, it's sort of illustrated also in, in Andrew's and Supriya's talks 
that the importance of, of linking the global to the local. Um, and I have a very sort of long memory of the original UN habitat, uh, which may go back to 1996, mm -hmm. when, when the language of culture was introduced into, into that symposium. And when I was a very sort of young teacher, it seemed to me such a useful hook to be able to then reference a lot of the work you did, which was actually to 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 start to acknowledge the, the role of culture and architecture. So mm -hmm. so this whole thing about the sort of the social and the environmental, I think has a long legacy. And I think it's wonderful to see the way Dory has uh, has has incorporated that. And Andrew, uh, in 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 your organizing capacity for this competition, and then Sapriya also for this this new way of making connections between the global corporation, if you like, and the local level. Uh, I think there's a really wonderful initiative. So uh, any questions uh, to, uh, to for, for any of the of, of the speakers? I'm looking in the chat room and I'm not seeing a, a question at the moment. Dory, you have a question. <laughs> I, so I have a question. Um, so Priya or, or, or Andrew can either both answer it. Um, but again, I think, uh, Anna, as you're sort of bringing up, there is something like, what is the role of competitions in, in this process, right? In this process and, and, and what, um, you know, like both in terms of organizing and in terms of participating in it, what's the role of, of competition in terms of either making these connections or making, um, Again, the community's perspectives, I don't know, better heard. Can I just can I just ask for clarification? Are, are you seeing that as a as as a as a negative that it, it, it happens, but it's happening through the role of competition, which is not actually a plus? Uh, um, no, I, I say it in complete neutrality in the sense of like, what is it? What do you see? What do you see competitions doing in terms of again in, in this particular space, right? Um, and, and again, <laughs> positive or negative is kind of up to their answers. I just add so as a genuine, genuine question, right? Okay. Uh, Andrew? Sure. Um, in our case, it's, it's actually an award we're presiding over, over a competition. Um, similar, but I suppose the, the critical difference would be it's, it's work that's already been done. Um, the purpose and I'm, I'm speaking personally, I don't know if this would necessarily be supported institutionally, um, lies in the fact that I think we've become very good at sounding the alarm at the UN for stating that there is an emergency, a multidisciplinary emergency that has to be solved at multiple scales. And once we get the attention of governments at whatever scale or practitioners, usually the next question is, oh God, so what next? What do we do? And it's well and good to give general guidelines and principles, but far, far better to be able to hand an inspiring example of a very challenging context where in a lot of ways, things have been brought together um, on the ground uh, and could be uh, replicable in other situations. That's, that would be my, my answer. May I just add one, one tiny reflection, Anna, now that I've got uh, Dory on the screen with me, it just struck me, I have to say, when you mentioned the four countries that were the late signatories to the declaration, three of these were exactly the same land rich countries that have been called out mm -hmm. in the report for global ecological damage. And I thought, you know, colonialism is not just about domination of people, but also land and the planet, two sides of the same coin. And I think for me, I hope that the universality of the SDGs um, helps uh, prompt a kind of a reconciling, not just for mistakes already made, but can help us prevent uh, replicating those elsewhere in future. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Supriya, did you want to make a comment to Dory's question? Yeah, I mean, very quickly, I just wanted to say, I mean, we mentioned two competitions. One was a competition where we participated for the design of the Mumbai Port Trust. And I think those competitions in the design, in the, in the practice field um, are very important because it takes, uh, it's where all, all the constraints of a real project are off, right? There is, there's no budget, there's no client, there is uh, no constraint on the number of people you can get together. So it, it's a very, very um, 
exciting space for innovation. Um, and so that in a design process, that's really important. The second competition was uh, applying for the local project challenge. And that's just, um, just, just an sort of our end result uh, to do all of this work. So that was more to motivate the students to sort of get together towards a common goal. But I think competitions have a huge role to play in the design, um, in the design field. Uh, and especially as someone being in the practice, this is one opportunity to sort of let loose and, and you know, uh, ideate. Um, I might just add, having been the initiator of the um, local project challenge, uh, we didn't set it up as a competition. Uh, we set it up as a, a call uh, for interest of people who were considering the SDGs. And um, it was uh, quite remarkable, the, the response that we got with no, no real incentives. Um, there was no, you know, at the beginning, there was no prizes. It was simply, uh, are you interested? Are you doing this? And that across this uh, project that we also went out to, uh, to the professions, to, uh, to education, and to civil society groups to to just really try and find out were people taking them up and if so if so how uh, and then of course at the end of it we we did decide well this would be we we should make some awards for for, for, for this um, and we also uh, were, were trying to 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 be quite populist uh, in the way that we approached this and so we put it out, we put it out for a popular vote and some 7,000 people uh, actually went online and, and voted for this. So it was, was really a little bit like what we're doing now, which is how do we sort of, you know, increase interest in the SDGs as, and, and not uncritically so, I mean, I don't think we would approach it in that way, but uh, how do we actually sort of get other people sort of on board with, 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 with some of the ideas? So uh, I just wanted to add that in. So any more questions uh, to, for, for our speakers or any comment by our speakers? I, I don't see any questions at Q&A, but I, I like to be able to contribute the thought to this discussion is that, you know, the question that Anna and I raised for this panel was uh, how could the adaptation or integration of international initiatives such as the SDGs help? Essentially, like how? So I have to say that this this came out of a, a, a skepticism on my part of saying how can these kind of broad scale international initiatives that is planetary scale really help the the necessary engagement and specificities at the, uh, at the local scale? And I think all three of you really address that in in different ways. And I, in particular, uh, Dory, like your point of saying that in fact we can turn it turn it upside down to say that actually at some at a certain point that it is the the local we need the global initiative uh, in order to convince some of the localities uh, who have not ad adopted or progressed the way that the world is doing it. and i think precisely that's where competitions call for ideas this is where it can help and as the discussion was, was happening, it just reminded me to be able to, this issue that competitions, concourse, um, uh, charrette, there is a tradition of it in, in architectural history that we, like there is this, um, although that, that was a, another mechanism or th that is a mechanism for a different purpose. It was about uh, achieving an ideal scenario. But so what's happening, it seems, with a lot of these, um, these projects, you know, especially the one that Anna had described, the local project challenge, is taking that tool for the design community and readopting it as a way to generate bottom-up ideas to, can, uh, you know, there is a freedom for students, practitioners to be working precisely what we're talking about, to be able to combine the local and the global and also to work interdisciplinarily and to perhaps work for a moment suspending the, the constraints of budget and regulations for the moment, right? I, I mean, you know, uh, unless it is projects like the one that are competitions, like the one that Andrew has showed us where it is projects that's been built, which it's, it's an opportunity for people around the world to see how, despite the local rules, 
and building codes and sanitation requirements and constraints that there is still this space for freedom, for resistance to the general status quo. So I just think that's really, uh, really inspiring and, and uh, allow us to, to have to be more motivated to be able to create panels such as this one and events such as this one. So thank you. Back to you. Anna. Wonderful. Well, with that, uh, with Joanne's comments, I think it's a really great way to end. And I would like to thank Andrew, Supriya and Dory for terrific presentations and for getting us started uh, on this, on this uh, journey today. So I'm going to close this session off now and I'm going to leave a couple of minutes uh, while we gather ourselves for the next session, which is People and Resiliency. Um, so we, in case any of you are just joining us now, um, uh, and I'm, we have assumed that possibly we will have people who join us uh, for one session or another. Um, uh, welcome. Um, my name is Anna Rubo, um, current co convener of this symposium with Juan Du, Dean of the, the Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design here in Toronto. Um, this symposium uh, also launches a call for engagement with the 2023 Union of International Architects World Congress, which has adopted the theme of leave no one behind and aims to promote, discuss, create and showcase architecture as a vital tool to help achieve the 17 US Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. So we applaud the UIA for putting the SDG center stage at their Congress in Copenhagen next year. So with that sort of brief reintroduction, if you like, uh, we want to get started on panel two, uh, people and, uh, and, and resiliency. Now, I am delighted to introduce you to our three speakers, uh, Jennifer Vandenbush of Sticky Situations in Japan, Johannesburg, so right now she is in Melbourne, Australia <laughs> uh, at a very late hour, so we thank her for her time. Um, Alexander Boyaki Mafu, uh, lecturer at NUST University in Kumasi, Ghana, and Linda Zhang uh, from Interior Design at Ryerson University. Our ground rules are that each speaker has eight minutes to address our panel set to question through their work or practice. So let's take a moment to look at question two. You can see it in the chat. Um, so let's say this question, how can participatory and inclusive design engage with the daily life and challenges of communities and improve their capacity to withstand, adapt or recover from adversity that may arise from social, cultural, economic, political or climate change events? Can the SGs help? So to get us started, um, I would like to welcome first our first speaker, uh, Jennifer Vandenbush, who is the founder and director of Sticky Situations in South Africa. Sticky Situations, great name, is a network of passionate and talented local and global urban professionals whose core intention is to create positive changes to the urban fabric, be that with people, processes, policies, practice or place. So welcome, Jennifer. Uh, and I look forward to your presentation. Hello. I didn't realise I was first. I'd better hurry up and clear my throat. Right. <laughs> and um, in the last, I was listening to the last session, and um, it's I so love that point about global and local. It's the only thing that works, um, I find, in the work that we do in Johannesburg. Um, uh, so people and resiliency, community plumbers. Um, next slide, please. So back in 2007, actually 2006, it was Anna that um, invited me to come to Johannesburg to assist with the Global Studio. Um, and for it ended up staying there for three years and I never left. 15 years later, I'm still there. It was a participatory design studio for future city building professionals. There are around about 120 Global Students. Spent time in Dipslut, a peri-urban settlement of the city between Joburg and Pretoria, trying to understand the challenges and doing some intense hanging out, that's a very technical term, intense hanging out, and developing design ideas. Very student-based and very, I, I, um, I, uh, what's the word? I, 
lots of very cool ideas, not necessarily all implementable. Next, please. So the biggest complaint of residents was lack of employment, of course, um, across uh, the entire of Southern Africa, and the state of the toilets in Extension 1. In Extension 1, there are 25,000 registered shacks. That does not include the registered with the Department of Housing as official shacks. That doesn't include the shacks in between. There's 642 toilets and 39 households per toilet. But of course, when we do mapping on the ground, we find the number is much higher. It's around about 50 to 55 households per toilet. The infrastructure was not maintained, still is not maintained um, in this area. In fact, in many settlements across South Africa, um, uh, ablutions and water facilities are not maintained well. Next, please. So the Global Studio students had some small ideas to tackle the very large toilet problem. A couple of years later, um, there was some data, um, about 50 water meters were installed in the area. And we calculated that there's a billion liters of water loss per year leaking from the top structures alone. That didn't include the infrastructure under the ground and the leaks underground. That was costing the city of Johannesburg uh, 20 million rand per year in um, lost water sales um, and yet to run a program to maintain it was going to cost 1.3 million. Anyway, I'm jumping ahead. Carrie, next slide, please. So it's all good and well to have design ideas and it's all good and well to have human rights. And it's a pity that slide on the left doesn't come up. It's my favorite piece of public art. It's, a, it's um, for South African Human Rights Day in um, Dipsut, where some of the local artists painted some messages on the side of the toilets around the main constitutional messages. Um, and this one was about everyone has a right to human dignity and everyone has a right to live in a safe and healthy environment. And it's all good and well to have these rights, but who's going to implement it? Who's going to maintain it? Who's going to fund it? Who's going to keep checking that people still want it or need it? And who's going to adapt it over time? And who has the will to actually make it happen? Next, please. So there are two organizations that emerged from Global Studio in 2007. There was What's Up Dipslut, which is a community plumbing cooperative, uh, residents from that particular part of the settlement that repairs communal sanitation facilities. And our organization, which has become um, an organization with a flat structure that facilitates participatory development. And for 15 years, um, each of us work on our own different projects, but we continue to work together in Dipsut on toilets. We're known as the Toilet Ladies. Next, please. So those small ideas from the students now have a very large impact. 10 toilets upgraded save 1.6 million litres of water over 42 days. So What's Up Dipsut now conducts cyclical maintenance on 642 toilets in extension one of Dipsut that are used by the over 25,000 households. And Sticky Situations partner with What's Up on many of these projects. Next, please. And not only are those and, and it's improving the lives of not only those using the ablution facilities, but also the WASAP team have become qualified plumbers and are growing their business. They're employing many local people in their many um, fun but crazy projects, like painting images on the side of toilets. Assisting researchers and students, there is a constant stream of researchers and students coming through this area, contacting WASAP, and now they charge. They have a standard charge that they charge people to come through and do their research. Um, they facilitate other programs such as the UN Habitat's Her City, Stopping Gender-Based Violence, Mandela Day, Cleanup Campaigns, etc. So they've become quite an active team. And they have assisted us with starting new plumbing repair programs um, around Johannesburg facilitated by Sticky and WhatsApp. Next, please. But 15 years of operation requires growth and partners. So there's been quite a few research reports which are very carefully crossed, but crafted and independently with data independently analysed because there is no political will to repair the top structures. There is no funding put aside for ablution maintenance and yet the conditions continue to deteriorate. There are formal qualifications. Plumbing qualifications have been a very big thing and took 10 years for the entire team to achieve. Long-term partners, that's a picture and the third one 
or the second one from the right is the Broken Toilet Award. It's an award that's made up of broken toilet parts and given to our long-term partners. And an endless stream of new programs and ideas like Adopt a Toilet, Tackle a Tap. It's really interesting how so few organizations are willing to fund sanitation. Water, yes, water is very sexy. Sanitation and toilets and poo and feces is not. And what's also very interesting is over the 15 years, the long-term partners have emerged from the plumbing industry, both locally and globally. Next, please. And always, 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 always sharing ideas, sharing skills and resources. Nothing happens in isolation. Nothing happens properly or sustainably or ethically if we don't work together. And this comes back to the comment in the previous sessions around global and local. If we don't share the resources we have, the knowledge that's on the ground, the people on the ground may not have cash, but they have knowledge and they have skills. The people that are global do have cash, and but don't necessarily have the knowledge and skills required on the ground. But there are knowledge exchanges that have to happen across all of those levels to make things work. Thank you. Hope I was in time. I think you were. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jen. Um, and wonderful to hear that up-to-date report about uh, WASOP and the way in which sticky situations has been in there for the long haul uh, of helping make uh, a lot of this work possible. Uh, and it is just uh, requires tremendous um, ongoing commitment. Um, but we can talk about that more later. later. So now let's um, go to uh, the next uh, presentation. Um, and we're very happy to have Alexander Berkey Martel. Um, and Dr. Alexander is uh, an architect and infrastructure planner with more than 20 years of professional experience. And he is currently a senior lecturer at the Department of Architecture at NUST University in Kumasi, Ghana, and a consultant at Space Architecture, Planning and Engineering. Um, Alexander, we look forward to your presentation and thank you. You have the floor. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me in this wonderful um, Symposium. I'm looking at um, designing for resilient communities, and what we we'll want us to discuss currently is about the perspective from the global south. We realize that though um, most of our cities are going to be urbanized, the its resiliency or how to become resilient is depending on where the community is, how they are looking at it, and the strategies that they are putting in place. And I want us to just look at it from the other side. Just look at over the other oh, next slide, please. And in this, we in this particular um, case, what I really want us to look at is the various definition that we have been actually been given um, to resilience. That's from Capucci and also from um, Brunel AR. The Brunel's um, definition of what resilience is is the ability to reduce the systems to reduce um, the chances of shock and also to absorb the shock and at the same time also to reestablish itself. But here we are want us to really look at it from the other side where multi-dimensional um, processes among stakeholders, that's the people themselves prepare to adapt to the environment. And this is what um, the issue then come to, how can we as architects and also community developers use what we have to encourage a community driven approach and as an academic and a practitioner, we've been trying this um, exper experimentally with some communities. And I must say that it has been yielding some results. And currently, we want to we, the next slide, please. We're trying to answer the question, how can architecture and design encourage community building? And we've realized that bringing the people together and increasing their understanding and also training the communities has actually yielded some results. And based on the various case studies that we also had in uh, Africa, as well as the communities that we are handling in, from our university, we will also understand that the po policy formulation is also very critical and also the employment of resilient methods. But putting this together and looking at what actually happened, 
uh, what is actually happening. We also realize that there are some community challenges that is actually going on, that the process of urbanization has also brought a lot of these uh, challenges that we cannot actually um, use just academia to solve uh, ac uh, academia to solve it. The complex system of networking and um, the virus, because in Ghana, apart from the fact that we have about 16 regions, there are more than um, 50 different languages that is being spoken. So you realize that making a particular community be resilient without using English, although the indigenous people do not speak English, becomes something that you have to really do it very, very carefully without actually causing um, destabilization among the communities. Next slide. And we have also understand, understood, understood that lack of inter-organization collaboration is one of the challenges that actually is creating the problem amongst uh, making these communities re resilient. And apart from that, too, the interdependency among the environmental systems. There, the picture that you see, the, see in the slide is some of the, one of the communities in, um, in Ghana around Kumasi where you realize that the community gradually is encroaching, development is encroaching on the water bodies and the natural greens that you have over, over there. And apart from that, to pollution of these um, environmental or very, very fragile um, ecosystems has become the main um, issue that we have to look at. And the next slide, the potential capacities that we think or we have identified that we think that can actually help is trying to increase the redundancy, robustness, and also make sure that there's connectivity within the system. New York, London, Sydney, all these communities have different systems or they have different capacity that they've exploited to make sure that some of their areas have become, can become um, resilient. But it's very important to know that every community is different. And what you may work, what may work excellently in one particular community as a resilient strategy can become another or may not perform exactly in another situation. So for us in Ghana or for us um, at, from KNUST, what we decided to do or from what we, we decided to take some lessons from Chigali, um, Rwanda. Although Chigali in Rwanda, I must say that it's a uh, very urbanized edition. What they did from what uh, they experienced in the 90s, um, the genocide, and how they have recovered. The next slide, please. How they have recovered is something that for us was something that we wanted to take some key lessons from it. And one of the key lessons that we took from the Chigali experience was the use, mixed use approach. Next slide, please. And the way they also included inclusivity and the incremental way of development. So, we decided to take these lessons, understand the systems that they have done over there, and create a hybrid situation that we can also use in, in Ghana and for the next five to eight years also implement. And in this, we identify some three major communities, which we dub it AKA, Asinkushia, Chebi, and Adakulu, where we have identified some level of fragility at the same time to a lot of potential and we are trying to put them together to create um, these uh, networks. Let's move to the next slide, please. These three communities have different potentials. And these potentials that they have, um, Asinkushia is one of the cities or the towns in Ghana with a very um, historic um, antecedents and from the slave, the slavery and other things. And, also, now the local people over there wanted to actually convert the place to become a healthy city with a culture, heritage and cultural background. So looking at that as a, a situation on the, our table, because the university um, from its policy wanted to now from hence do, do impactful research. That's research that has impact, not just publication for journals and readership and books alone, but impact that will change the lives of the communities where we are. So we took Asinkushia, we have taken Asinkushia as one of the communities. And then the other community, which is Chebi. Chebi is now trying to, trying to model it into a smart, sustainable um, city. And modeling it into a smart, sustainable city, just three days ago, um, UN Habitat came for the assessment and accredited it as a 
uh, a silver racing for an as an SDC city. And the next step that they want to move is to into a smart sustainable city. So based on that, we also connected connecting connect, connected it to Adaklu, another city in the Volta region where it also has virtually almost um, apart from the people that they have over there and its landscapes, there is virtually nothing. So, but what they have is the human beings and they want to make sure that there's a sustainable technical and entrepreneurship community where the people are going to be developed. So for us, the experiment that we are trying to look into here is that how do we network these three communities with our partners from abroad at the same time, the local universities and other faculties to get the work that we, the work that we are trying to do. And what we have also understood is that against all us, the next slide, please, the COVID-19 has also shown that none of these or none of us is actually free from um, any shock and none of us is resilient until all of us is resilient. So for us, it is good that we put, we build the capacities of these communities, then increase the interconnectedness and also foster cooperation. And the Increasing the interconnectedness is not only the, in the local interconnectivity, but also the international connectivity. In that, from our work that we are doing currently, we have also tried to link um, these, some of these communities with our partner communities from Germany and from the UK to make sure that these communities learn from some of the things that they are doing there in terms of renewable energies. At the same time, those communities over there are also learning from uh, uh, the communities locally how to use frugal systems to achieve the same thing that they are achieving over there. And to foster cooperation, we are linked, we are going to, we are trying to make sure that we link other universities to be part of this tripartite um, resiliency that we want to create among these three communities. And the way forward, for us to reduce, absorb, and recover means that we need to identify the potential hazards which we are currently doing amongst these three communities with the people and also find the possible capacity to withstand and absorb these hazards apart from that too we are creating um, solutions to recover from it and one of the key areas that we're trying to is the materials that these communities have in the, the central region where asinkushia is they have a lot of bamboo so the university is currently investigating how to utilize this bamboo to uh, create experimental housing and at the same time modular housing for the poor and not also not only that we've also invited um francis Kerry, who is also um, um going to actually work with the university to create different type typologies of houses especially using the mud but this time around we are adding another twist with the bamboo adding bamboo to it and um, creating the solutions that we want for these communities the, most of these communities have to tourism as their major source of income but the key thing that they have is the people over there and one thing that we have realized is that if we manage to make network these communities together bring them together and make sure that they work and understand each other locally then internationally also glean from the knowledge and the experiences that the others also have we will be able to share the knowledge and also in the long run create a resilient community using what we have on in our hands thank you very much thank you very much alexander um, that was a very very full and informative presentation and very relevant to our topic uh, i think we haven't had much mention of COVID, but that certainly that message that COVID has shown us that none of us are resilient until all of us are resilient is something that we need to uh, keep, keep in mind. So uh, now we're going to move to Linda Zhang. Now, Linda is an assistant professor at the X University of Interior Design, a visiting scholar at NYU's Asian Pacific American Institute, the 2022 X University Library Researcher in Residence and co-founding principal architect at, at Studio Para. No, I'm not muted. Um, I was just asked if I was muted. I don't think I am. Um, so uh, I would like to now welcome uh, Linda Zhang uh, to, to make her presentation. Linda, welcome. 
Thanks so much for the introduction. and Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. Um, I'm going to share a project called Planting Imagination, which is a community co-design project in Chinatown West, uh, just down the street in Toronto, uh, that uses virtual reality and collective imagination as a means to increase uh, civic participation, um, access, and better equip the community to steward the future of their own built environment, uh, including pandemic recovery. Uh, so if any of you were in the audience um, also last night at our Reimagining Chinatown 2050 event, uh, you'll find many threads from last night's discussion will continue through today's talk, uh, especially around the power of imagination and social dreaming to enact change um, as well as direct action in the present moment. Uh, so this project is, of course, not set in 2050. Um, Planting imagination is set in the present. Um, and in fact, we will be launching the community co-designed garden at Cecil Community Center this August. So we hope many of you will all come visit and join us in intergenerational community gardening, skill sharing, and cultural programming that the Planting Imagination Collective is putting together for fall 2022, as well as summer 2023. Uh, next slide, please. So this project seeks to leverage extended reality technology, including collective and shared virtual reality and augmented reality as a means to make design process more accessible to community members with the ultimate goal to foster community control stewardship um, as a pathway to community resilience in Chinatown. The advances in computer graphics, both in terms of software and hardware, over the last decade have enabled complex di uh, digital 3D models to actually be accessible from a web browser of computer, tablets, and iPhones. Uh, these technologies can help folks envision what a space could be. They can help non-designers imagine possible futures. Yet access to these technologies remains asymmetrically balanced. Uh, so virtual reality and 3D scanning have proliferated in our industry, but are still primarily used by real estates and developers to sell architecture, which is to say to displace community. Uh, even the VR platform we are using on screen here, uh, their main market is real estate. Next slide, please. We can no longer take for granted who these technologies are being developed for and by. Um, and we urgently need to work together to make these technologies more accessible to non-designers and to reduce barriers of access and gatekeeping within the architectural profession, and rather to share our design knowledge and welcome community into the design process. On screen here, you see our multiplayer web browser based design platform uh, working with technology ecosystems designer Janet Alford, we sought to create a collaborative, accessible and open source design platform uh, for our pilot site in Chinatown, West Toronto. So in contrast to hard to access single user design software, this platform is free, it can be accessed from an ordinary device directly in any web browser and allows for multiple community members to simultaneously design together live from anywhere in the world uh, via uh, internet connection. Uh, with all these advances in animated 3D computer graphics and WebGL, we were actually able to build this using the open source JavaScript library 3JS. Uh, which also interfaces with the free modeling software Blender. So this was a very intentional decision on our part to ensure that the methodologies we were doing in this project would be accessible to others in the future. Next slide, please. We use this platform during a 2.5 hour co-design sessions, um, actually several sessions, where over 30 community researchers were able to simultaneously co-design the space together. So on screen here, you're watching uh, a time lapse of one of these sessions. And if you look carefully, you'll actually notice that a lot of people did not agree with each other, which we all know happens a lot in community organizing and um, community based decision making. Um, and uh, so one piece that one person may have designed and added is subsequently deleted by someone else. Um, thus, part of the role as architects and designers in this project is actually to help facilitate and run these sessions. Um, so beyond just the technology, there's also a lot of knowledge transfer around how the design process works, how do we work together, upskilling community members, both in terms of design, as well as hard to access technologies with the ultimate goal of increasing the inclusion of lesser heard voices in the design of the built environment. Next slide, please. Um, so that was just one session in our 10 session series, uh, which runs from January through August 2022, um, that leverages a number of different types of shared digital technologies to bring the printing imagination collective through the design process. Um, so a few notes here in terms of accessibility is that during our recruitment phase, we actually learned that uh, we needed to deliver every session simultaneously in multiple languages with live translations. Um, we currently have multiple community research on the projects who have lived their whole lives in Chinatown, 
um, but and have so much to say and share, but have literally never had the opportunity to engage in the civic process because they have always been delivered in English. They have never had access to being able to share their ideas um, in Cantonese, in Mandarin, in Vietnamese. Um, we also identified it a need to deliver every session in person as well as online. Um, so a number of our community members did not have access to computers, um, phones, emails, or even just like a landline phone number. Um, so where it, there was the only way to join for them would be in person. And on the other hand, we also had community members who were unable to join in person um, due to the pandemic, um, due to being higher risk in positions of COVID-19, due to mobility, or just you know, safety commuting to Cecil Center in the context of heightened anti-Asian violence. Um, so open access to these sessions um, is uh, so one of the things that's also project deliverable that we're working on, it's not just the technologies and making those accessible, but we're also um, uh, wanting to openly publish and make publicly available by late 2023, um, all of our session plans of how do we run these co-design sessions? How do we deliver them? So this could be a useful tool for others to use uh, in the future as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so we currently have just completed session five, which is the AR session you see on screen here, um, where you can see an overlay of the digital design from the web platform over the real life garden um, at Cecil. And so we also built in a download feature into our web pl platform where you can just click and download the design instantaneously and it can be immediately brought into Blender and then into VR or AR. Next slide, please. A distinction I'd like to make here is that this project is not a project without architects or without designers, but rather that we're rethinking the role of the architect within the design project uh, process and challenging this. So rather than the architect working for the developer or the city or the property owner, uh, the architect here works for the community or for community interest. So this means that the architect's role is to facilitate and realize the community's collective vision, not the collective vision of the person who holds money. Um, so uh, the unique set and the unique skill set and professional knowledge of architects is still really crucial to accomplish this. There's a lot of knowledge sharing um, in this whole pro in this whole process that is a collective um, group co-design. However, the decision making power and control remains within the community. So having this agency and building this kind of community power is actually what supports community resilience. Um, however, this does present some new challenges. Um, so first, as I, I alluded to earlier, typically your client is a single entity. Um, and as we know, a community is never singular. It's never a monolith. Um, there's lots of disagreements, lots of different kinds of needs. Um, and so the process of how to work together and decision making also needs to be established. Um, this, this is also part of the research that we're doing um, and evaluating in terms of success of our pilot project. Next slide, please. Um, second, the client usually pays the architect. So in this case, actually, we, the designers and architects, we're actually paying all of the participating community members a living wage as community members for their knowledge, research, and contributions. Um, so I think we can't really talk about people and resilience without also talking around um, about labor, capacity, capital, and resource. Uh, so community organizing is almost always volunteer labor where burnout and capacity um, and the need for knowledge transfer and upskilling are some of the biggest barriers. So in this project, it was intentional that we did not start this project until we had funding. Um, being part of an academic institution, there is such a long and very terrible history of uh, extractive research done on communities. So we needed to make sure that we had the funding to be able to have the capacity to actually be a good community partner, to properly support community members and be able to um, properly accommodate access. So now that we do have the funding, um, our focus is on how we can build collective ownership within the group so that the community collective can continue to steward the space and the collective beyond just the time frame of the project. So our aim is to upskill community members and build community power in such a way that by the end of the project, we are no longer needed, that the capacity would then lie within the community. Um, another goal of the project is to empower folks to have the confidence um, to participate in other civic design processes in Chinatown, urban developments and community organizing within the neighborhood in the future. Um, and all of this is to promote community resilience um, in the context of Chinatown. Um, so finally, if you'd like to learn more about this project um, or upcoming community led uh, public programming, uh, please visit our website at plantingimagination.com and please don't be shy to be in touch. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, I was just noting one of the comments in the chat and said that was awesome. <laughs> Indeed, it was awesome. Um, so we have uh, a, a little time to uh, for discussion of this uh, of this this topic uh, since everybody stuck beautifully to time, um, and uh, I would like to um, to to consider what sort of questions would be relevant uh, to 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 trying to take this topic further. Um, I think we've heard some absolutely great examples, and I would just like to highlight just two little points that came out for me, which was in Jennifer's presentation uh, when she mentioned how um, the WASA group had been sort of inundated uh, over the years with requests for tours, for uh, research and so on, that they had started to make charges for that. Um, and I noticed also uh, that Linda was just saying that uh, people were paid as part of this. And I think that has has been a sort of an issue with many of these of these sort of enterprises, uh, which you might call it a colonizing activity in some way, or uh, the sort of way in which sort of communities and often poor communities uh, can become exploited by either academic or research sort of interests and so on and so forth. So uh, with that as a preliminary comment, I would like to ask whether, um, whether Jennifer or um, uh, Linda or Alexander would have uh, any questions that they would like to 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 bring up for for for, for general discussion. Um, any 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 starters? Any hands going up? Oh, hand. Can I, hi. Yes, didn't put my hand up. Sorry. I, I didn't. I, w I thought it'd be quite interesting, um, Linda. We've done a lot of facilitating um, sort of digital design things in Johannesburg and in a lot of um, much lower income neighbourhoods. And it's quite interesting um, what you're saying. We just to compare notes in a way that we have enormous tech issues. So when we try and design, so for example, we will go to a settlement and we will say, right, the design has to happen on the ground because people need to be able to visualize the space and the physical space and also try and learn a new technology that they've never used before um, in an area where often these poor neighborhoods don't have good data signals and so they can't get access to these online platforms. So we find that we and then you know sometimes the people with the most knowledge and the you know it's the grandmothers with with the children um, and the grandchildren that often have the best comments to make but can't translate it into it. So it's quite interesting interesting the way you, um, in these in these sessions and, or things on, on these digital design platforms there are so many different challenges that come to light that um, you're sort of eventually able to preempt it as you come forward and, and I think the challenge that we have we do a lot of public space facilitation in these designs so therefore it's all good and well to design and you know to, to reimagine what a safe space for youth and children might look like when there is just a dire need for anything for young people and youth and for chill and hangout space and, ch and interactive children play equipment but it's never going to be implemented because you might get a concrete bench but you're not going to get an interactive concrete bench that plays music so it's kind of interesting that um, just to compare notes on the sort of different outcomes and the frustrations that we have um, in Johannesburg with these ideas really important critical but not necessarily and they're fun but the really good thing is that it allows government departments to take note. So when an organization like your own Habitat brings their Minecraft set up and 10 people have designed a space, all of a sudden the government departments will say, hey, well, you and the Habitat and the Minecraft program um, accepted that these five things are critical for this space, so we are going to design it. So it also brings a legitimacy to a design, which I thought was interesting. So sorry, not a question, Anna, just comparing notes. Yeah, I think responding to that, um, for us, I think it's been really interesting to learn what the challenges are. Like, I think what we expected would be the challenges that we'd need to overcome, um, bringing all these digital technologies to a lot of folks who, like, you know, don't, like folks who don't even have a mobile phone or like a phone line at home, who like definitely don't use computers and don't use VR, don't use these digital technologies. The challenges have actually been not the ones that we necessarily expected. 
Um, we've learned that actually um, the Chinatown seniors are like super excited to learn the new technologies. I think initially we were trying to make it such that um, it would be very low barrier. So you have facilitators who are there who could kind of use the technology for you and sort of show you things alongside you. You could kind of act, it, interact with it through someone else. Um, but then we immediately realized that the seniors really, really care about learning this. Like they really want to know how to do it themselves. And that's actually why they're here. That's why they, that's why they, you know, signed up. That's why they like wanted to be part of this. It's like a, a knowledge transfer that they were like really, really hungry for. Um, we definitely are also encountering some of uh, the sort of infrastructural challenges. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we've been doing like, you know, Wi-Fi upgrades to Cecil Center to even be able to like run our sessions. We bring technology into, you know, every, every session. Um, we have sort of like bring these things with us. And there's definitely like a kind of longer term conversation on kind of like what the infrastructure could be here, um, it's amazing to be working with the community center as well. So the infrastructure, like there, there is also um, an organization behind, uh, you know, if we can make some infrastructural investments as well, there's kind of a space where it can kind of, um, you know, stay and, and carry forward. Um, but I think what's been, uh, yeah, very exciting about the whole process is just kind of actually learning what, um, what the challenges are and what, uh, our, how we were so wrong in what we thought initially kind of anticipating and going in, into this process. Great, thank you so much. Um, does anybody else have a question for any of the, of the panelists um, um, or any comment about the other presentations um, to our, our, our presenters, uh, comments on, on Alex's or Jen's or Linda's presentation, any? debate between you you three. <laughs> um. I have I have a question for Linda. I'm um, just um, while she was she was talking, I was um, asking myself. So if somebody in Africa wants to use um, such a system for discussion, do you have um, a system where the um, in terms of data requirements for such um, activity is minimized because um, even right now, whilst I'm having the video video presentation, when all the cameras goes on, the network availability here will go will go down. So, is there I whichever what stage are you in in terms of making this available to all, leaving no one behind? Yeah, no, that's a, like that is definitely a goal that we're working towards. We're definitely not there yet. So, one of the things that we spent a lot of time doing for the web platform was actually just optimizing how we're building all of the 3D models um, so that they are as small <laughs> as possible. And there was like a, a probably like a two year learning timeline um, from previous kind of research projects to get us to the point uh, where they're as small as they are now. Um, one of the things that we're kind of really pushing on, which is gonna happen after this pilot project is basically making a version of uh, this like playable game that could essentially be um, playable offline um, so that you could actually bring it on to like you could when you're connected somewhere to uh, internet access you could like bring it onto the computer um, and then you could basically like it would be a more limited in terms of like you wouldn't be able to have 30 computers all playing at the same time but you could have five in the same space connected to each other um, working to, working together. So that's sort of like a, a longer term challenge that we're working through because that's actually, um, it actually is even still an issue here. So when we're playing here in person, we're actually having to uh, basically um, ethernet connect every single device because there is not actually Wi-Fi available um, that would even like, run basic, I, I couldn't run this call on Wi-Fi in, in that space. Um, and so it, it's, it's been a new challenge that ha we have actually learned um, is crucial in this process. Um, and I think the other part of it is also uh, kind of learning about how uh, much of Chinatown is actually disconnected from um, any kind of access at all in terms of um, internet connection or even just like phone connection, like how many folks really rely on just having to meet in person. So I think that's definitely also changed kind of the course of how we're thinking uh, about access to some of these platforms as well. Um, so 
still working towards it, but definitely like a um, something that we're quite critical of as well and looking to kind of find um, other pathways moving forward. Thank you. I think we have a question from Joan Lu. Oh, I, I had thought just to follow up this, this issue of uh, really about basic infrastructure. That it is quite interesting that, uh, for example, uh, in the context that Jennifer and Alexander are working in, uh, in Latin America and, and, and in Africa, the, the um, and many places in, in Southeast Asia and Asia that I'm familiar with, basic, basic infrastructure is water, <laughs> is electricity for light, it is um, basic sanitation, it is shelter. But however, we are also realizing more and more that in order to further build the community capacity and to contribute to upward mobility through self-learning, through participation, that an another infrastructure that is very, very important is knowledge. And you know, a, a lot of the things I think we're talking about, um, you know, the, the, the activities, Jennifer, you, you were mentioning, and Alexander, you have shared in your community the building process and, and Linda, um, it, that this, this issue of access to knowledge via in-person or, or digital means um, seems to be you know, another, another tool for us. So I'd like to hear um, a bit more press from, from Alex and, and from Jennifer in, what, in working with the specific, specific uh, local communities that you are working with, what are the most basic infrastructural necessities that are most at risk today. Oh, pick me, pick me, pick me. <laughs> Sorry, Alex, do you, do you want to go first, Alex? <laughs> um, I also just got a, um, a private message oh, from Jabulani Nkachwa. He can't raise his hand, so he'd like to ask a question after this. But please pick me. So infrastructure, what's failing? We once had a, a group of people from developed country come to a city workshop where our team were invited to, to ask us to dream, imagine what Dipslip would look like and let's dream big and then we'll figure out how to get there. But I think the point what we kept trying to make to them was it doesn't matter how big we dream, we can't get the rubbish picked up. We can't stop the dumping in the wetland that is now five to six stories high and is choking the wetland. We can't stop the drug users living in the wetland and attacking the young girls that are walking through. We have basic infrastructure we are in we you know and i guess it's the spatial segregation of the post apartheid south africa where the wealthy and the poor but it seems you know it's like every country but in the poor areas there's no data signal there's no safety there's no policing or the policing is corrupt it's like you know it's like every it's every other country that struggles with these sort of issues all of the infrastructure is failing in the poor areas and the private sector are the ones that have the infrastructure. Um, I, I can't think of a single thing that actually functions really well in the spaces that we work in all the time, unless it's run by the private sector and whether it's the taxi industry by the lower income private sector or the, high, the, the very fancy diamonds coming through and the gold, it doesn't matter. If the private sector pays, it works and the public sector pays, it only works in the fancy spaces. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Jennifer. You're you're very energetic for being two a.m. wherever you are in your in your place. Thank you for that. Uh, it's Alex toilets. It's toilet talk. It always makes me excited. <laughs> um, uh, Alex, uh, could you like to respond? Yeah. To then we have one question from Reese. And Reese, after this, yeah. can you uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? One of one of the things that we have learned. Um, working with these communities as um, i've already said is building capacity and building capacity uh, what we realize is that most at times when these projects are getting to the community for one for example one of the projects that we're working on they wanted to bring electricity and thinking that when you bring in electricity the people get um, other things and they develop realizing that the light will come and they will not be able to pay for the electricity that is in there so we realize that it's not just electricity but rather making sure that the ability to end with little, that's the entrepreneurial spirit, the entrepreneurship, so that if somebody has um, $5 um, to live on in, in, in one week, 
how can he turn over the five dollars with the farm or the whatever that he has to be able to so what we decided to do is that frugal innovations is one of the key things that we are building capacities of these communities how do you make more from the little that we have and in our stakeholder engagement that we had at um, 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 Chibi, we try to explain to them about digital economy and how all these things, but we broke it down to the fact that how do we use digitalization to help the hairdresser, to make sure that the hairdresser is able to um, get work done and make profit. How do we get um, digitalization to make sure that the taxi driver or the palm wine tapper, the one who actually make local wine, also make money from the digital economy. So these are some of the things, how do we build capacities in this format? And the other key thing is also, how do we make these communities, or these projects politically resilient? And so in Ghana, we have two major political um, fronts, the NDC, the MPP. So in choosing the communities, we chose one from the current regime, the other from the opposition, and the another one from the neutral. So that you no know, matter whichever um, government that is in power, as a university, we will still have um, the resilience in terms of political um, resilience that we need to make sure that the project runs. Most of the times when the government or regime changes, whichever project that you are having in a particular region can also come to a standstill. So one of the strategies that we put in place for to resist this type of um, um, changes in, in, in shocks for projects, which is ongoing with other international collaboration, is to make it politically resilient. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there's a question in the chat uh, from Rhys Young, uh, and uh, who can't unmute. And the question is that being that working with community can be such a learning as you go process, how do you appropriately scale or plan for the future phasing of projects? Anybody like to pick that one up? I can give it a shot. Then at least I can show, give an example of our, our experience. Um, the question of um, the learning as you go. Yes, it's very, very, um, very, it, that it is real. But to appropriately um, plan for the future facing, you will need to do it with the community themselves and do it with the people. For especially in Ghana, we normally focus on the traditional rulers because the traditional leaders um, who are not elected into power, they are not people who are thinking in four years because it's almost like the monarchy. So they are, if the traditional rulers are there, or the people have a local allegiance to them. So we normally take them through and then give them the um, specific training for them to be able to think with us. So it takes almost like um, the various phases that we academically maybe have done out of research, we bring it back to them, explain it to them in the, the local language, let them understand what the implication, and then out of that, we're able to pick what they intend to do. For Chebi, we realized that what our plans were in terms of what we wanted to do, they also had a different plan altogether in terms of how they wanted the community to be. And we have picked that one up and brought it back into the university to let it be part of our studio programs where uh, students are now researching and coming up with different ideas. Well, we will go back there again and make a presentation to find out how they see it and where they think it should be. In terms of facing, normally they are the best people to tell you how to um, face it out because when it comes to resilience, the main people to make the project resilient is the community members themselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexander, for your thoughtful answer. We do have another question for you in the chat room, but because we're now out of time, uh, could I refer, refer you to that question? I think you can see it also. And if you could answer it online, that would be wonderful. So um, I would like to thank uh, all of the presenters uh, in this session, uh, to, uh, to Jennifer, to Alex, and to Linda. Uh, I think you have given us a very lot of lot to think about and I think you've contributed enormously to our understanding of how do you create resilience on the ground and uh, so I thank you all for the work you do and for the time that you have spent in preparing uh, for this and for sharing uh, with us all uh, around the world so thank you and so I'm now closing off panel two discussion
and we will move shortly to panel three, uh, which Joan Du will moderate. Thank you so much. Before, yes, I would just like to add before we, before uh, Jennifer go to bed and Alex uh, log off, um, I just want to extend both of you for joining us from so far away. This is what technology also allows to do. Um, I also wanted to let our audience know, and perhaps Alex, if, if there's any students from KNUST from your community that is in our participant, is that the summer uh, Daniel's faculty at UT is collaborating with Alexander and with his institution of KNUST to launch a joint um, a joint summer project that is long term, so that we hope to be able to have Ghana students to come to Toronto during the summers for study and internship, as well as for UCI Toronto Daniels faculty students to go and actually contribute to the community building projects that Alexander is leading with his group and uh, his community. So we're very much looking forward to that, Alex. Thank you. And, and Jennifer, I hope we can also speak uh, soon after, and we have many students who will also love to be able to contribute with you and to continue to improve infrastructure, especially on the toilets. So thank you so much. Yay, thank you, everyone. Okay, so yeah, we will now. Much. Thanks, thanks, Alex. And thank you, Linda, for joining us from down the street. And uh, as I had participated in um, the talk that you had organized last night on Chinatown. It's, it's so exciting and we look forward to as well participating and contributing to it uh, as a school and me as an individual, a fan of China, a new fan of Toronto's Chinatown as well. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So we now are, we'll move to our third and final panel for this symposium on community and housing. I am delighted to introduce you to our three speakers, which are who are Teresa Williamson of Catalyst Communities in Rio de Janeiro, Jet Lung of Cave Urban in Sydney, and Matthew Hickey of Turo Architect Base in Toronto. And first, let's take a look at the question that we posed to our panelists and that we would like to also invite our audience members to be able to, to follow along and, and think about it uh, from your side. The question is how could practitioners, researchers, and policymakers engage with the communities in need to seek solutions towards housing that is affordable, accessible, healthy, safe, sustainable, well-designed, and proximate to civil civic amenities? Can the SDGs help? And the emphasis is on engagement with communities in need in this point. And I think we're all interested to really explore how do we design with communities rather than just for them. So with that, um, so again, the, our ground rules are that each speaker has eight minutes to address our panel, the three questions through their work and practice. And after that, we will engage in a Q&A and discussion. So first, I would like to invite the, the first speaker of this panel, Teresa Williamson. Okay, I see she's there. Teresa is a city planner and founding executive director of Catalyst Communities an NGO working to support Rio de Janeiro's favelas through asset-based community development. She received the 2018 American Society of Rio Prize for her contributions to the city and the 2012 NAHRO Award for her contributions to the international housing debate. Welcome, Teresa. Thank you so much. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, always wonderful to, to participate in events with Anna um, and uh, hopefully share our work uh, and how we see favelas and community uh, organizing and planning on uh, with these communities um, with a broader audience. Uh, so I'm going to try to be quick because we have eight minutes, but uh, because I'm speaking from a di very different context in Brazil, I often like to show a lot of images and give a little bit of background, which I think is essential to understanding our particular circumstance. I'm gonna be talking very much from the perspective of informal settlements and planners who work with informal settlements. 
And it's important to recognize that in the context of Brazil, we're talking about very um, established communities. These are not slums anymore. They're not squatters anymore. Uh, most of them are generations old. The oldest favelas actually turning 125 years old this year, same original blueprint. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So in the global context, right, one in three people today lives in an informal settlement. 85% of housing worldwide by some estimate, estimates is built illegally. Um, and this is only gonna expand in the next 50 years. So the UN predicts about a third of humanity will live in informal settlements by 2050. And so there's sort of a call to action in the work that we do, which is if we continue to see these communities as an inherent problem and as an aberration when they're actually the way cities form and they always have in some ways um, pre-industrial, uh, then you know we're gonna be shooting ourselves in the foot. So urban planners need to really think about them in a different light. So next slide, please. Um, and you know, drop the double standards. So if you visit a lot of UNESCO World Heritage Cities, most of them started informally. Uh, most of them are recognized for the blueprints that were established through informal settling. Go on to the next, please. So um, our organization, Catalytic Communities, we basically are a nonprofit set up to support community organizers in favelas. We started in, 20, in the year 2000, so we've been around for 22 years. Uh, and what we do is we identify people on the ground who are already doing work to try to support their neighbors and we figure out how we can support them. And so over the, this model has produced a number of projects over two decades um, and uh, also an understanding of informal settlements and how they organize and how to support their work and their development. Uh, and so this slide is just to show that uh, sort of our conclusion of what the favelas in Rio anyway uh, all have in common. There's nothing here that's inherently negative or positive. Uh, they're neighborhoods that develop a, as a solution for the lack of affordable housing. There's no outside regulation, which can be negative, of course, because it can breed all sorts of uh, complexities and, and problems, but it can also breed a lot of creative solutions um, and resiliency. Uh, they're built by residents for residents, so that means that they're actually often meeting needs in ways that development by outsiders for low-income communities don't. Um, so every brick, every tile that's laid has a sort of embedded history in it as well. Um, and it's valued by communities as they grow. And they constantly evolve based on culture and access to the city and so on. So you can go on, please. Um, in Rio, we have a thousand of these communities. They're located all across the urban fabric. Um, and 24% of people in Rio live in these communities. It's also important to recognize that they have a strong uh, history uh, going back to, you know, embed that they're, they're a product of Brazil's legacy from slavery. Um, favelas in Rio are predominantly black neighborhoods. Uh, in the city that was the largest, Rio was the largest slave port in history. Um, and so a lot of the reason they still exist after so many generations is because of policies of neglect um, and repression in these areas. Go ahead. Yet, uh, despite all of that, right? Oh, sorry, before I talk about that. Um, this slide is, I think, uh, really you know, useful for us as planners and people working in these communities. And, and to be honest, anywhere um, and even with individuals, um, just to look at the way government programs typically uh, handle informal settlements or low-income communities pretty much anywhere on the left uh, and the way an asset-based community development approach um, looks at these communities. So our work is very much from an asset-based community development approach um, framework. I'll share the slides in the chat after so anyone who wants to dig in deeper can. Um, but essentially we look at communities through the qualities that have been developed over time um, and we work you know, with residents based on their demands. We recognize residents uh, as, as the, the developing people as the aim rather than you know, developing the territory, which is often the aim of urban planning. Go ahead. And so in the context of Rio, um, you know, I mentioned we have 100 plus years of these policies of neglect, repression. Uh, the favelas have nonetheless developed to some extent 
um, really much really on their own, uh, except for a few examples of urban policy over the years. Uh, and um, yet they developed all sorts of qualities uh, that we can recognize as urban planners. A few years ago, during the Olympic buildup, the Olympic uh, Village was actually recognized as a lead neighborhood development certified site. Uh, we worked with one of the lead ND architects of the lead ND certification itself uh, to do a similar study of a favela nearby. And we actually found that the favela nearby, which is a, a, a particularly livable community called Aza Branca, was, uh, would, would rank higher on some of the low tech elements, right? So neighborhood pattern, um, location and linkages, that kind of thing. Go ahead. And there are a number of qualities that favelas in Rio, you know, uh, have that planners are trying to build into cities, right? Portable housing, responsive architecture, low social isolation in non-COVID times, right? Um, which breeds uh, social engagement and mutual support and so on. Go ahead. Like I said, a lot of these slides will be available after, okay? Um, somebody in the last session talked about COVID and how it, critical it's been to showing uh, that we all really depend on each other and, and whoever, you know, what, when, when some aren't resilient, none of us are truly resilient. Uh, in Brazil, this, the, the, the case was very much made by favelas themselves, who the government essentially turned um, a blind eye to, uh, and yet they organized themselves. This is a community in Sao Paulo that actually organized uh, block watches, they would bring, make sure everybody had the resources they need to get through the pandemic, the information they needed. Uh, they even rented ambulances so the community would have access. Um, they, they did a huge campaign, but that wasn't just them. Uh, go ahead. It was really communities across uh, Brazil. In Rio, we uh, worked across 24 organizations within favelas actually collecting data on COVID. These are community groups collecting data in the absence of government. Go ahead. And built the COVID-19 in Favela's unified dashboard. So the most robust data about the impact of COVID-19 in the favelas of Rio, which were one of the hardest hit areas in the world, came from communities organizing data collection and also new forms of uh, harnessing data from government records uh, since government records didn't have favela specific data. We had to estimate by zip code and so on. Go ahead. So um, the question, you know, I, I guess um, something that, well, I think it would be good to have more questions in the Q&A, but basically uh, what I think Rio shows um, is that if we invested in decentralized planning, and, and I, again, it's a lot to go over, so I'm trying to keep to the limit, so I'm going to end now, but um, if Rio uh, is an example, right, of what communities can do, um, in the absence of government. And when government does come in here, uh, typically it's not helpful. Um, even when policies are passed, and it was mentioned in the last session, we can have human rights on the books, but that doesn't mean they're implemented, right? So it's absolutely critical, especially in informal settlements that have self-built over time, uh, that they control their own destiny and that we as, um, as, as planners and others are actually there as supporters of that vision and their community assets. I think there might be one more slide. Oh no, sorry, there's a couple more. Shoot, we're over time. Okay, I forgot to, I'm sorry. Usually that slide comes at the end. Can I go slide. for one more minute? Okay. Um, so just mentioning the Sustainable Favela Network is a network of hundreds of community organizers uh, in Rio working for the sustainable development of their communities. Next slide. Um, we've mapped this network. There are 120 projects on the current map. Go ahead. Um, and the network works basically to support a number of themes from, you can see them there, climate justice, all the way down to sustainable housing, solidarity, economy, food sovereignty. Uh, and it's a network, so they do exchanges, we're doing infrastructure, uh, a, a solar energy, green roofs, um, different collective action campaigns, uh, and it's all led by these community organizers. Go ahead. And then the Favela Community Land Trust Project is uh, a way of thinking about land rights where we would actually be able to embed this community control uh, permanently into a community fabric uh, through formalization of informal settlements, but where they own the land collectively. Go ahead to the next step slide. 
where they own the land collectively. So this image in the top left is typical private property, which a lot of people in informal settlements um, are, are trying to acquire because that's the only model really that's ever been made available. Uh, but now there's a growing movement which started in Puerto Rico and it's been going in Kenya and it's been growing. And in Brazil, um, it's been expanding the last few years, Bolivia and other countries um, to provide collective land titling to the land in informal settlements. So communities can retain their strong community ties and resist real estate speculation as their communities become formalized. Go ahead. So finally, um, uh, again, concluding, what if we cons in consolidated self-built communities, the planning processes unfolded in ways that further consolidate and strengthen that community action that's been built over generations, creating a virtuous cycle of resident led and responsive uh, creative urban development. So thank you. Sorry, I was a little bit um, jumbled by the slide in the middle. No problem. Thank you so much, Teresa, for bringing us this uh, great presentation and all the wonderful points you made, um, we are definitely coming to the realization that the, the informal is in fact the dominant ways in which the world operates. Uh, whether I, I would argue that it is not only today, it's, it's the way it's always been uh, and that we have only chose, especially in architecture and planning to recognize the formal and engage with that. So, you know, the, all of the wonderful scholarship and community development that has taken place in Brazil, and especially especially in Brazil, but around Latin America has really been, I, I would say, a precedent for many scholars and community workers from around the world. Uh, so again, for me, being familiar from the, the Chinese context, for example, the city that I've been working in, in Shenzhen, one out of every two lives in an urban village, which is an essentially self-built illegal housing. And that's a city of 20 million. So we're talking about 10 million population living in affordable housing that was outside of regulation and was built despite of rules and planning. So it, it, it is such an important aspect for us to talk about that when we're talking about housing, especially affordable housing, we must recognize the formal and the informal in any given city. Thank you so much. Next, uh, we have uh, Jed Lung. We want to welcome Jed to joining us. Jed is co-founder of Sydney-based architecture collective Cave Urban, alongside Nish Nisi Long and Juan Pablo Pinto. Utilizing the fluid relationship between art and architecture, urban, uh, Cave Urban explores, creates, and tests new structural systems outside the compliance of the architectural profession that emphasizes community engagement, and the continuation of vernacular traditions. Welcome, Jed. Thank you. Um, today, I uh, want to talk to you about uh, something that's evolved out of our practice um, and in collaboration with another organization in Indonesia, uh, the Environmental Bamboo Foundation. Uh, and it's a project that has uh, really been based upon the work of the EBF, uh, who for the last 25 years have been focused upon the restoration of degraded land uh, through the planting of bamboo as part of a diverse uh, forest system. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Thanks. Uh, so the goal of the EBF is to create new uh, livelihoods uh, through restoring degraded land. And in Indonesia, uh, there is a lot of that. Uh, and also they want to make sure they can maintain and uh, ensure the ongoing cultivation and care for a local environment uh, in which their projects are based. So it's a project uh, based upon local engagement and education uh, where they're establishing village-based industry. Uh, and in the case of our project, uh, they're looking to value add uh, to the bamboo that they're growing before they sell it to industry. Uh, however, um, Whilst their project has been looking at increasing the supply of bamboo uh, and bamboo products, uh, they also at the same time have needed to find a way to increase demand for bamboo. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is where our collaboration with the EBF has come in, uh, where together we identified housing uh, as a key mechanism for increasing the consumption of bamboo particularly given that Indonesia has a very large uh, housing deficit that they're seeking to address. 
however, most of the time, uh, this is taking place through the use of carbon intensive materials. Uh, so, you know, a very famous uh, social housing system that they have is based entirely upon using concrete. Uh, and so we're very interested in finding a way to insert uh, bamboo and particularly uh, laminate bamboo products into this uh, housing system uh, as a way of displacing, um, I guess, more traditional industrial materials with higher carbon footprint. And so um, by processing the bamboo, we're looking to um, turn it into a laminate material that overcomes some of the existing negative preconceptions about bamboo as a low quality building material. So from this uh, Rumor Bamboo Lestari or Sustainable Bamboo Housing uh, was born as a program and the SDGs have been key to our process the whole way along uh, because it's allowed us to frame uh, the goals of our project uh, and quantify how uh, we're addressing, I guess, the entire value chain. So we're very interested in looking uh, particularly at um, how we can bring some of the lessons from the EBF's work with bamboo farmers, establishing these um, village-based uh, pharma co-ops uh, and I guess helping them to develop their own um, uh, production uh, facilities to be able to harvest and then process the bamboo into a semi-finished product, which means uh, by the time that they sell it to manufacturers, they've been able to value add. Um, and then um, through uh, partnering up with a few different industry partners, uh, we've been working on the development of laminate bamboo and prototyping out new ways of um, building with this as a material. Uh, and um, that's led to, I guess, a, a number of different prefabricated structures that uh, we're able to uh, prefabricate and then ship um, on the back of a truck. So everything has to be broken down into modules that can fit onto a truck and move around um, uh, the various kind of rural communities uh, and then put together uh, by the community uh, in the different locations we're working. Next slide, please. Uh, and so the reason that we decided to work with engineered bamboo was that um, there's a very long tradition of utilizing timber as um, a building material in Indonesia. But I guess uh, with the widespread deforestation uh, that's taking place across the archipelago, uh, it's no longer necessarily sustainable material. Uh, and so we've looked to bring in um, a laminate bamboo product as a replacement to that. Uh, and one of the interesting things about working with bamboo is that it has a very high annual yield. So bamboo can grow very fast. Uh, a single bamboo pole would be ready for harvest after about three years. Um, but also bamboo, unlike a tree, continues to live once it's been harvested. So it means the farmers growing the bamboo can actually harvest it every single year, uh, which increases their resilience. Uh, because you know, if you imagine that you're waiting 20 years before you can cut um, down a tree, uh, it's a very long period of time where something can go wrong. Whereas if they're able to have a, a yearly return, um, it's it, yeah, it helps to build resilience. Uh, and at the same time, um, bamboo is able to sequester carbon dioxide, so. Um, you know, a cubic meter of bamboo will hold about 1.65 tons of CO2. Uh, and so by processing and cutting down the bamboo, we're actually extending the lifespan of the bamboo um, and locking it up in housing. Next slide, please. And so key to our process has been um, a series of prototypes. Uh, so this program actually originally grew out of um, some um, uh, post-disaster shelters that we were building in Palu. Uh, where we were looking to work with bamboo splits uh, because it meant we could ship the bamboo more efficiently. Uh, and so we were shipping in the bamboo splits and then turning them into housing. Uh, but based on feedback from a number of different government organisations, uh, we were kind of directed towards trying to build something a little bit more permanent. Uh, and so we started to develop um, these, these housing modules. And so on this screen here, you can see one of our first prototype frames that we were structurally testing, where we were mostly interested in creating um, a, a kind of a primary structure out of bamboo that we could then infill with uh, local materials based upon wherever um, we were building these houses. Uh, next, next slide, please. So the assembly process was um, key to the prototyping and the development of this project. Um, the idea was that each of these members could be prefabricated 
um, and then shipped on these trucks. So by flat packing uh, the structures we were building, it was allowing us to more efficiently move around material. Um, and also by limiting the size of each of the members, uh, it meant that we could yeah, fit them on smaller trucks, which allowed us to get into kind of more remote rural locations. Uh, and then on site, it allowed for rapid construction. So one of the um, pieces of feedback that we had was that we needed to be able to put these buildings together really quickly. So um, it comes as a kit of parts that can be assembled um, using community labor. Uh, and then once the initial framework is built, um, it can be infilled. So next slide. Thanks. Uh, so in this instance here, um, this is one of the houses being finished uh, with, uh, you can see some coconut timber for the purlins there, and um, that's bamboo strips being woven into a ceiling. So uh, again, it's kind of talking to, I guess, the vernacular tradition where you had a primary structural material that would be, um, uh, I guess, complemented by different local materials. Uh, and then the framework again was designed as a way of um, creating a structurally stable uh, system that was tested for um, and, uh, earthquake resistance uh, so that we knew that the primary structure we were building would be able to stand up. Um, and then uh, there's a number of different ways that it could be filled in afterwards. Next slide. And so this is one of the frames once it's up with its roof. Um, this one currently is being clad uh, and um, yeah, having, having the exterior added to it. Uh, but we're very interested in making sure that um, we could, I guess, build something, but at the same time, really think about the entire value chain. So not only do we end up with a building at the end, we're also thinking about how we can be restoring the local landscape, how we can be introducing um, a new livelihood that might be based upon, I guess, maintaining and growing the local environment. Um, and then at the end also, yeah, building housing that's climatically appropriate uh, and able to hopefully displace some of the um, more carbon intensive materials. Thanks. Thank you, Jed. Uh, thanks for that wonderful presentation. Uh, you know, the, there's such beauty and dignity to the entire process that you have created. Um, bamboo being one of the most sustainable and fastest growing materials we can use for, uh, for building construction. And it, it is exactly kind of one of these vernacular traditions in, in Asia and especially Southeast Asia that, I have, um, that I'm so happy to see that now um, there are groups like yours and, and a few others that, that is looking at this not only as a building material for construction, but also as a gross material that's growing the communities and getting the local communities to be involved in the, not only the, the, the growth of the material, but also the construction process and the maintenance and et cetera. And that is such a, a wonderful way forward. And uh, definitely that is taking us into, uh, I think a, a, new, a new phase of architectural participation into the communities. Thanks very much. Oh, thank you. Thanks. So next for our final and last but not least speaker of this panel and also at the symposium. No pressure, Matthew. <laughs> next we have Matthew Hickey. Matthew is a Kenyan Kahaka architect belonging to the Six Nations of the Grand River First Nation with over 16 years of experience, experiences working with Truro Architect, an indigenous owned and operated firm here in Toronto. Matthew is also currently contributing to the teaching here at the Daniels faculty at UT. His research looks at the realignment of Western ways of being towards thousand years of indigenous knowledge across our built environments. Welcome Matthew. Thank you, Dean Du, and thank you to Teresa and Jed for those amazing presentations. Scano, Sego, Segoli, Songwengo, Matthew Hikigiaso, Hatne, Songwengo, My name is Matthew Hickey. I'm Gayet Nagehaga, Mohawk from Six Nations. Uh, I'm also a practicing architect. Uh, we run our office out of Six Nations, which is the largest uh, Indigenous uh, First Nation in Canada. 
Uh, and I'm coming to you from Tree 13 Tech Toronto, Dish with One Spoon territory. Um, before I begin, um, I usually start my, my talks out about a little bit of teachings from the Indigenous community or what's happening within the Canadian context. And I had the opportunity to speak at the Interior Design Show yesterday, um, where I started my talk uh, about clean drinking water uh, or with the idea of clean drinking water. Uh, it's unfortunate to, to acknowledge this, but we have issues with our First Nations across Canada to this day, some with clean drinking water issues that have been going on for over 25 years. Um, and it's uh, something that we really need to be working on, looking at internally. But it's something that I wanted to bring to the forefront in thinking about how we can be more uh, collected with our community and create better resilience in the North and for our First Nations. Um, so I'm an architect by trade. That's what I do on a daily basis. But today I'm not going to show you any drawings. I'm not going to talk about our work. What I'm really going to speak about is the way that we are trying to shift the paradigm and how we think about architecture. And one of the things that we're seeing that's occurring uh, more and more these days is a realignment of uh, Western ways of knowing and being towards Indigenous ways of knowing and being. This is a graph that we use here on uh, to kind of illustrate this. And uh, with this, with the central ring, the golden ring there being Indigenous uh, values, Indigenous ways of knowing and being, we're seeing uh, over the years a, a quick realignment, especially these days, about how we're approaching work and how we think about the built environment around us. This is really important for us. Uh, and what I'm going to try and do over the next uh, six minutes now is to try and frame our approach to uh, Indigenous architecture and the way we think about approaching this work. Next slide, please. I had the opportunity to uh, write an article for with the Ben Quay Conservancy for Azure.com last year, just to be or actually 2022 at the beginning of uh, COVID. In this article, I talk about the differences between Indigenous and Western ways of knowing and being, and our need to adjust our mindset. So decolonizing the way we think about design and architecture and the processes by which we create the built environment begins with taking humans off the top of the pyramid and placing them as an equal part of the circle. Next slide, please. In colonial ways of knowing and being, there's a hierarchy, sometimes referred to as competitiveness. You're always trying to work your way to the top, but everyone and everything will eventually be below you. This can be related to humanity. We think as humans, we are better than everything else around us, that we are special. In indigenous ways of knowing and being, we place ourselves as a part of that circle. This is non-hierarchical or non-competitive thinking. We need to understand that humans are no more important than a single drop of rain. This way of thinking informs how we approach our work. Next slide, please. <clears throat> When we think about modern humans in the scale of the existence of the earth, we have to understand that we are just a blip on the timeline. Uh, these, uh, we think about water, we think about trees, they've been here for millions of years. They have systems that we don't even understand yet, and yet we are constantly displacing them, controlling them, using them, and treating them as resources. Now, People, think, people may think that we are a unique and evolved species, but in reality, we are just a happenstance of genetic mutations that have only proven their worth for a very short period of time. Further, we are the only icon on this page that can easily be removed and the world will still go on. The world does not depend on us. Next slide, please. So what do we do with this way of thinking? So we've been thinking a lot about how do we make cities and urban developments, communities more resilient, stronger, better. So some people would argue that technology is the key to solving these issues. But for us, we think about how do we enact this idea of universal inclusivity to help fix our cities, to help fix our communities, to make them better, to create better ones for everyone and for everything. So for us, we had came up with these six F words, and this is, we posed the question, what would happen if all the power goes out, if there's no more electricity, what then makes a community resilient? What makes a city great then? So the six F words, food, flora and fauna, family, fun and flexibility, and I'm just going to go through these quick. Uh, food for us is really important. You know, there's food insecurity that runs rampant across Canada. Uh, including in First Nations, and how can we access food in a better way? How can we treat our landscapes as a resource within these urban developments, allow for people to have urban agriculture, to provide space for these, uh, for us to have the sustenance? 
flora and fauna, we are nothing without plants and animals around us, and we are constantly displacing these specifically in urban developments. How can we create place for them, which is not only beneficial for them, but also us as humans, we need these around us. Family for us is really can be translated into community as well. How do we create better communities? Um, Co-living, co which I was happy to see, and also multi-generational households, creating space for those types of interactions that we've lost in today's society. Fun for us is about uh, recreation. How do we have cities that allow for us to be able to get outside, to be able to exercise, to be, to be in nature, um, also spaces for play, places for informal and formal learning. And the last one for us, flexibility. This is about thinking seven generations ahead, creating cities that are flexible enough that they can adapt to our quickly changing communities and environments. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the other ways that we've been trying to really push uh, this idea of how we think about the world and our relationship around it is kind of changing the way that we talk about heritage. Uh, there's, when we speak about heritage, it's often referred to as the built form. And specifically here in the city of Toronto, what does that mean? Does that mean when settlers came? Uh, that's often what we value, the buildings that are built by people that are not of this land. For us, we would like to speak about this as historic fabric. This allows us to think beyond the built form, going back to natural processes, the buried rivers that we have here, the changing shoreline, the glaciation ret uh, retreat, to a time that is beyond human occupation, before Indigenous people even, by starting to open up the conversation about values of historic fabric, we can then start to place ourselves within this timeline and start to see what's important to us as a society. Um, this also allows us to think ahead, uh, often placing us in the, in the, in the, uh, the here and now. Um, next slide, please. Actually, next slide, please. Those are a little bit out of order, but it's okay. Um, so, two row architect. What does that mean? You may be uh, thinking about uh, what this is. This is the two row wampum or the Kaswenta. This is a treaty uh, or a wampum belt that records an agreement between the Dutch and the Haudenosaunee. Uh, the two rows of beads represent a canoe uh, and, a, and a Dutch ship traveling down the St. Lawrence River, River on parallel paths each one moving forward together and not interfering in each other's affairs. So this is how we like to work at Tour Architect, in collaboration, bringing together the strength of Western ways of knowing and being and Indigenous ways of knowing and being so that we can create a better future together. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew, for sharing with us your presentation and reminding all of us that if we are speaking about sustainability, we need to be thinking about the entire ecosystem and not only um, the, the, the human occupation. And, and indeed that if we don't urgently address some of these challenges, we will be moving into a post-Anthropocene world. Uh, I'm certain of that. So, uh, you know, this is what is really wonderful about some of these cultures and practices that have existed, not only for, for, for centuries, but over millennia um, in the various locations all around the world. And you know, what, what's interesting is that there is something um, really wonderful about the, the, the three presentations we just saw that took us around the world, from Brazil to Indonesia and, and here uh, in Toronto, and reminding us that when we're speaking about culture, when we're talking about his, speaking about history, when we're speaking about communities, we have the intelligence that dates back to centuries. Uh, you know, as Teresa um, has presented in her talk, you know, what we, what you know, many of the favelas and formal settlements, they actually have existed for over a hundred years. Uh, the the urban villages, Teresa, I was mentioning in Shenzhen have existed, some of them over a thousand years, but now they're seen as an informal settlement that needs to be demolished. And you know, certainly we know many architectural precedents as, as using local wood and, and bamboo, that, that those cultural practices and construction process that, that do go back centuries and over, over millennia. What we are doing with 
contemporary design and technologies, we must tap into these heritages that uh, have, I, I think, probably for too long, have been overlooked. And, um, and especially when we're speaking about sustainable design, especially sustainable design housing, there's been so much emphasis on the technologies and the latest technologies and the applique's that, um, that very often what gets overlooked is a lot of the embedded intelligence in the communities themselves, the embedded um, intelligence in the materials that one can use. And, you know, it was Matthew's case, the embedded intelligence of the memory of the land that continues to live through to today. So thank you so much for that, for those panel, uh, for those presentations. Um, we had a couple questions in the Q&A um, that I see Judd was really great in answering them already, but it's okay. Well, I, I thought one of them was interesting, the one about resin, which I thought it, it, it really is a critical question that I think I'm curious how you answered it. But there's a question I think for Teresa. I judge from the time that this question was typed in, it is for Teresa. So this is from Frederic. Hi, so hi. So if you see this as a system, what is the exchange rate between external and internal factors? And I assume this is a question addressed when you, when you were speaking about the, the relationships between the favelas and the, the policies and, and regulations of the cities at large of understanding that much of what's happening in the inside the favelas are community led as an in internal. Okay, so should I try to answer that? Sure, if you would like, yeah. I'm, I'm, I mean, it, I'm not quite sure um, how to answer that. Uh, it's definitely a system. I think everything is a system um, and everything is part of the same, you know, one system. I think Matthew uh, showed that as well in his presentation. Um, a lot of people talking about interconnectivity. Um, but yeah, no, I think within the, the relationship between government and favelas is very much one of at least, I don't know if this is what you're asking, but here in, in Rio, um, you know, I alluded, mentioned, you know, the history of slavery here and, and how it really isn't taught. Um, it's not something that's at the tip of people's minds. It's that's actually shifting now very much in the last few years, actually, strangely, um, but positively, because uh, it needs to be discussed. And, uh, and it really is foundational to how the whole city evolved. We, I mentioned 24% of the population lives in favelas. I didn't show a racial map of the city, but it's an overlay of informal, formal, wealthy, low income. And basically by keeping these communities precarious from a public sector investment perspective, so inadequate sewage, inadequate electric, um, electricity, et cetera, over so long, uh, inadequate land rights, um, sorry about that. <laughs> They, they manage, you know, they end up keeping um, this permanent underclass, um, the low quality of public education. Um, you know, there are all of these things that sort of maintain this permanent underclass. Um, and, and so it's very hard to break out of this, this cycle. Um, and uh, anyway, I can, I can go into all of these things for, for ages, but I, I don't know if that's what you were talking about. Um, to break out of that now, um, there's a, I think, I, I don't know if this is true, I don't know what everyone else's perspective on this is, but I, my feeling is that sort of the more dysfunctional the local government, often the better the local organizing. Um, and so we have incredible grassroots organizations and movements here, uh, and they're all embedded in a really thick network that collaborates intensively. And that's been getting stronger and stronger over the last decade or two. Um, and, and, I, and so there's a lot of hope coming from those sorts of movements and, and their growth and, and their visibility through social media and other you know, venues. Thank you, Teresa. I, I think the idea of recognizing first that there is that exchange is really important and to recognize the values of those exchange. I think very often one thinks of the exchange between the external, meaning external to informal settlements uh, towards internal is only one way, like, but it's, I would argue, and I, I think Teresa, you're too, that it's two ways. And there's tremendous values that informal settlements have contributed to the, 
to all cities and not only the cities um, that we're discussing today. Um, so Jed, the, the questions, the two questions in the QA, Q and A that was for you, I think they're, it seems like they're really, they're two different items, but they're speaking about the same thing, I think, right? One is asking the challenge of resin being an additive substance to this natural material of bamboo. And the, the other one's questioning, um, rather than using bamboo, it's natural form, do the processes of cutting and laminating and forming to utilize, to create um, an extended material product from it for use. I, I think I think these two are, are, are beyond the technical. I think they are speaking at the heart of this adaptation that we're speaking about, whether it's from the vernacular or from the natural towards it being an instrument of use for design construction. So it'd be great for you to speak about that for all the audience. Um, yeah, no, definitely. Um, I'm actually writing my PhD on a fairly similar topic at, right at the moment about all of this um, because I am a big fan of using natural bamboo and that's actually most of my practice. Um, so I'm very interested in the irregularity of bamboo and actually how we create different systems that can account for working with natural materials. Um, but I guess in the instance of this project, uh, I like to think of um, the way that we're working as complementary to working with a natural material. Um, natural bamboo has been used for thousands of years in many different vernacular settings. Uh, uh, but one of the biggest challenges of working with it is that it's an irregular material. Um, if you think about a tree, a tree gets processed into lumber, it gets cut down into dimensioned elements that we can build with. Uh, and so with bamboo, it's much harder to do this. Uh, so if we were to take a pole out of the forest, it has, you know, obviously very little impact. Um, and so by processing it in any way, it's always gonna have a, you know, a, some larger impact than if we used in its natural state, but there are advantages that you get from processing it um, in the sense that uh, we get to standardize the material, uh, which means that we can structurally test it. Uh, it means that we can, you know, allow for more normative construction practices. So uh, if you think about a natural piece of bamboo, every bit of it is different. Every piece is different. So no two connections are the same. It means every single time you want to make a connection, you have to solve a unique design problem. Whereas by turning it into a rectilinear form, you know, suddenly we can deal with things like prefabrication. We can bolt it together. We can work with hand tools people might be familiar with. Um, you know, in a way similar to timber. So I think whilst processing it, yes, it makes it less natural. And by using glues, yes, it brings in elements that aren't necessarily um, fantastic for the environment. Um, I think at the same time, when we start to compare it to other materials, it's still sitting right down in the natural materials end of the scale. Um, and the, what we gain from processing it uh, is wider acceptance, the use of bamboo in situations that it might not usually be used in. Um, and I think that's a really important thing. So it's really easy sometimes for us to, especially when we're talking about natural materials, to kind of play one off against each other as if one is better than another. Whereas I think we want to think about diversity. We want to think that materials can be complementary to each other and that there's actually a plurality of ways in which materials are used. And so it's actually about responding to that particular situation. Thank you, Jed. I, I, I would ask um, the, thank you for raising these questions to our audience in the q and I would also welcome you to take a look at Cave Urban's work, because there's also, uh, from what I can see, beautiful works that do use irregular and natural form bamboo as well, to get to your point about the needs to, to consider all possibilities. So uh, we have a question in the Q&A also for Matthew. So could Matthew please comment upon the speculation that Tomo Chichi of the Yamakros made a contribution to urban design in Europe in his collaboration with Oglerthorpe in the design of the squares of Savannah. 
I have no idea what that is. So I don't think I can comment on that. If, if there's an expansion to that, maybe I can reply. So this question is from Michael Briston. Uh, I, I assume, you know, the, the planning of the urban squares of Savannah as an earliest settlement in, in the US, in the United States has always been uh, referenced at least in American urban history as something that really was a precedent of this kind of grid, the gridded city, the gridded settlement, mm -hmm. right? Um, and Savannah as it has evolved from those earliest settlement um, years into today has evolved quite organic, organically with these squares, especially the gardens and public spaces that is in there. So that, that's the, the, the context yeah, yeah. of that. But I'm not sure what the, the, the I am also unaware of the literature that is around the speculations, but, um, but it would be interesting for us to be able to, to look further into that. But I, I think Matthew, you know, certainly you could Perhaps speak about um, for the city of Toronto, for for example, that yeah, yeah. Um, how past practices by the First Nations in the settlement patterns mm -hmm. um, have influenced the urban form of Toronto today. Yeah, I mean it really hasn't, which is kind of interesting in the sense where we've we've uh, there were First Nations here for thousands of years, including three distinct groups: the Mississaugas of the Credit, with the last ones here. That's who our treaties are with, uh, but also the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat people have been here since the glaciers retreated about ten thousand years ago. There's evidence of their existence in this place over eight thousand years ago, and if we take a look at the mapping of where they lived, it was all along the rivers and tributaries a lot of which in Toronto are now buried and under <laughs> underground have been piped in. Um, I mean, there's an interesting thing about, uh, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with the grid structure. I often use the reference to Serda's plan in Barcelona and thinking about how we can live better as community. And for me, this is really not necessarily about the structure of the street layout uh, as a grid or non-grid or organic. It's really about how we kind of stack those systems together and thinking about, uh, in the sense of Barcelona, it's really about creating a community where everything is within walking distance and kind of that granular ground plane that allows you to go shopping, to go to the pharmacy, to go get uh, your frozen food, and then also live in that space. The uh, parks and spaces in between, between become much more dynamic. You have uh, different uh, age groups interacting with each other, the old people walking to the market, young people playing. So I think that for me, that's the really important part is this cross kind of mix of use and um, and, and, and uh, mixed occupancy of these buildings, uh, how we do that. Uh, we're doing some work down on the waterfront here in Toronto, and there's a lot of buildings that have gone up recently where you have uh, roads that are one street away from the waterfront that are basically back doors. You have loading docks, you have exhaust vents, and there's no real streetscape that's there. And what we're really trying to do is create place so all of these buildings, like in a, in a set of plan, all the faces that face the street actually have some activation on them. Um, and are not just, I mean, we do need our loading docks in there, but it's, it shouldn't be a full street of that type of approach. So hopefully I, I talked a little bit about what you're, you're looking for, but um, that would be my comment. Right. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so do any of the panelists have questions for each other or comments? Um, I mean, maybe I'll just comment. It's amazing to see Teresa and Jed's work and uh, just kind of the alignment of thinking about what's happening here in Canada is happening in other places uh, as well. So really fantastic to speak with both of you today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was, it was um, fascinating. And I've just been thinking about how nice it would be to do this face to face where we could explore things in more detail. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, each of each of the things we're talking about is a whole universe. And it's hard to do to, to do justice in, in such a short um, span. So maybe down the road, there'll be an opportunity post COVID. Definitely yeah. hope so. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I guess I might just add that um, I think what came out of all of these presentations is, I guess, a desire to draw upon some level of local tradition. Um, 
and how you bring that into practice, I think is always a very challenging thing, um, particularly not relying on something that is token. Um, and so I think, yeah, the idea of, I guess, traditional cultures and how we can learn from the way that they've lived on the land and the way that maybe, you know, vernacular architecture teaches us about living, um, you know, is a really challenging aspect of architecture. Um, but I think it's, you know, reaps really great rewards when you can find a way to engage with, you know, a cultural history because it embeds so much more meaning into a project from the very beginning. Thank you. Thanks, Jed. I, you know, I'd like to give a, a big round of thanks to our final group of panelists for this incredible discussion. Uh, thank you to Teresa, to Jed, and to Matthew. And Teresa, we're, we will take upon your recommendation for continued discussion and dialogue. Um, you know, Anna and I are very pleased for all of you to, to, to have been able to join us online. We are going to have a beer with all of the local participants later today, and we'll raise a glass to you as well. And, and look forward to the next time that we'll, we'll, find, we'll, we'll find an opportune time to really bring our community together, right? And, and it is when we are speaking about communities, I very often think that as practitioners and architects and activists and, and um, policy shapers and academics, I, I, I do feel that it is also very important for us as a community to connect with each other, um, to be able to see the struggles that we face while they're very unique within our local context. We can also draw inspiration, aspiration, from the community of practitioners from all of the around the world who are really trying to invent a, a different way to go forward or perhaps additional ways to go forward, right? These are not necessarily, we're not making value judgments on either or, as, as Jet was speaking about, but this importance for greater diversity of practice, greater diversity of design methods, greater diversity of knowledge, and greater diversity of recognitions for important contributions. And it's very often when we're talking about the vernacular, when we're talking about the traditional, when we're talking about the informal, those are viewed as something that is quaint, that is old fashioned, and that is marginal. But in fact, I would say that if we really look deeper into all of their practices and all of their, our systems, whether it's from the built environment to the natural environment to economic processes, actually it is the dominant. And, and as uh, designers and, and practitioners and academics, I think you know, it is our role to really reveal the importance and really the scale that we're speaking about, that it is not just uh, minor. It is not only the, the top 1% or the, the, the lower 1%, however you, you see this, but that there is a need to really recognize the, the power and the, the, the existing power and the existing contributions they, they already have made to our world and, and to our cities. And, and that if we're looking at strategies for the design for resilient communities, that we should definitely be tapping into all of those as well. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna invite Anna to come back to join me for our concluding uh, remarks. I, you know, first of all, I, I really want to be able to just take a moment to thank all of our panelists who joined us from all of these different time zones uh, and various uh, states. Thank you to Andrew, Sapria, Dory, Jennifer, Alexander, Linda, Teresa, Jed, and Matthew. We hope that you have also um, enjoyed the conversation. I want to thank all of the Participants, I see we, we still have a, a number of participants. We haven't lost you at the end of three hours, which is a really great sign to see. Uh, I'm informed that we also have an audience following on YouTube Live as well. So this is just, um, a, a, for me, a very inspiring group of uh, contributors. And we very much hope to be able to continue this this dialogue. I'm going to um, ask Anna to um, introduce to us some of the next steps, you know, picking up that point that Teresa made that, that we should find ways to continue. Um, Anna. 
Well, <clears throat> thank you. And thank you all for this wonderful session. Um, it's been stunning <laughs> uh, and, and so encouraging to hear all the wonderful work that is being done. Um, we, uh, uh, Joanne and I have been involved uh, in the planning uh, for the UIA Congress, Sustainable Futures Leave No One Behind. And I think we have both been very encouraged by the fact that uh, the conference is really around the idea of, of trying to get um, the design professions on board with the SDGs. Um, I think this would be a marvelous thing to do. Uh, I would have no illusions that, um, you know, if all the design professionals did this, that all the, they could cure the ills of the world. But I think it would be an incredibly important first step and a step that goes beyond some of the other frameworks, the other sustainability frameworks, because they are so intensely broad. And to be able to sort of think about the social, the economic, the political, and all the other issues, the cultural issues, uh, I think that's such an important thing to, to try and serve all of us to get our heads around. So uh, we are working now to help them provide content for one of six panels. And the panel that we are co-chairing is number three on the screen, Design for, for Resilient Communities. So can we have the next slide? Um, and I think I've just talked a little bit about the vision, so we'll go to the next one. Um, here we have the members of this different scientific committee. Uh, and on the left, you can see who all these people are. You may recognize some of them. Uh, we have design for climate adaptation, design for th rethinking resources, for resilient communities, for health, for inclusivity, and for partnerships for change. Uh, within embedded in all these different themes, uh, I think some of the key issues, key issue, issues that have come up today about migration, about climate change, about displacement, about bottom up sort of strategies. So each of these panels uh, now has uh, a, a lot of content behind it. So let's have a look at the next slide. Um, Again, this is rather difficult to see, I, I would imagine, but what Joanne and I have done is to develop the, the, the panel description, which you can see on the left. And then what we've done is to develop um, seven sub questions, sub panels. And uh, we had a lot of discussion about this as to what these might be. And we've sort of considered that the, when we would talk about the SDGs and, and, and everyday life, we would talk about um, um, the uh, notion of people as partners. We've heard a lot about that today. We'll be talking about the global and the uh, crisis and rising inequality. Um, we are also number four is to talk about local practices and global corporations and some of what Supriya talked about today. We were thinking, are there more? Is there more out there that we could we could we could draw upon? Uh, 3.5 is housing and the right to the city. Uh, again, I think a lot of what we've heard today speaks to the issue of the of housing as a right. Um, another one, and I'm very pleased to the the number six is the digital to democracies. And how do you create equitable communities uh, digitally? And so I think some of what Linda has talked about has certainly spoken to, to this issue. Lastly, and this is the one I would like to just focus on a little bit, is the uh, 3.7, Design, Education and Resilient Communities. And um, we have um, put quite a lot of thought into that as to how you can uh, uh, is there education out there which um, is um, supporting um, the, the SDGs? Uh, could there be more done? Um, and also in the introduction, I mentioned uh, this UNESCO report, uh, Knowledge Driven Actions uh, Transforming Higher Education. And it states quite clearly um, that um, the SDGs uh, should really be introduced into higher education in, in institutions. So we're interested in sort of posing a question, uh, could the adaptation of, or integration of SDGs provide interdisciplinary knowledge and tools required to address issues of resiliency and inequality, as well as the ability to work collaboratively with communities, past, present or project initiatives, studios, coursework, build process or research 
that demonstrate how the inclusion of SDGs, the Green New Deal, or other resilience strategies might throw light on these questions and courage. So we have put out these seven different sort of headings with sub descriptions, and we're inviting a call for papers for submissions. Uh, we've also had lots of conversation that, you know, there's academic papers, there's experience, and there's visual essays and so on and so forth. And here uh, on this page, you can see is the, are the formats and the dates. And so probably I would just focus on the first date. Um, the other dates roll in quite fast behind. But by June 20th uh, of this year, we're looking for abstracts of about 50 to 100, uh, 250 words. And the idea is just really see who is out there, who is interested in participating. Um, so that we, we, we get some sort of idea. So we would be absolutely delighted uh, if everybody who uh, is online still with us could take a good look at these few pages and also share these pages, because I think we do have an opportunity, just as we've done today, to open up um, so much fascinating work and so many wonderful initiatives uh, around the world to, to encourage people to share those. And I think the more we share this, the more we build knowledge, the more we open up new questions uh, beyond the, the usual ones that are asked, um, the better off we will be. So with that, I will conclude. Um, this is uh, just trying to get you in enthusiastic and excited about, um, about participating uh, in, in, this, in, this, in this World uh, UIA World Congress next year. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Anna. I, and again, I would like to just to be able for, for, for those who's watching now, who's, who will be watching on YouTube later, if you can go back to, um, if we can go back one slide to the formats of submission, uh, as Anna was mentioning, we put a lot of thoughts along with other organizers of the UIA event in really thinking about uh, submissions to be as in inclusive as possible. So this is why that in addition to the typical research paper format, we're also are including visual essay, we're also including narrative essays that are, you know, perhaps ethnographic and argumentative essays as well. So this is in recognition that while we're utilizing academic process for this particular conference, we really want participation to be from all sectors and all levels. So meaning not only academics, not only architects, and, um, and it, it is not only through words, but also could be through images as well. So we you know, want to be able to rely on you to be able to help us to disseminate this call, really call for ideas. It is a call for papers, but it's, it's again, a, a call for ideas uh, and for, for participation. So, um, so I thank you. Again, I, I think you can, uh, we can stop, right. So th thank you. And we uh, miraculously are quite close to following our, our three hours uh, timeline, Anna. So thank you so much again for joining. Uh, we hope that this is the beginning of a series of conversations that we will have with our international community as well with our communities here in Toronto to be able to continue this dialogue on these important issues. Um, I will also like to say that this concludes the, the Daniels faculty uh, winter term, winter term 2020 public programs. We hope and uh, you have enjoyed um, your participation. And if you miss any of our events, including this one, you are welcome to watch them on the Daniels faculty YouTube channel. And if there's any further questions, or comments uh, or recommendations to Anna and myself, please also don't hesitate to reach out to us via email as well. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. <laughs>